The mayhem continues as we enter the round of 32 here at Heroes of the Dorm 2016. We're broadcasting live from ESPN's Wide World of Sports on Watch ESPN, YouTube, and Twitch. Today, we have 32 teams fighting for 16 spots in the bracket. Who will be the collegiate teams that will advance to the round of 16? These games have been fantastic. Oh my gosh. It's getting low. I don't think they're going to be able to save it in time. Oh, Melkor taking a lot of damage here, but zero goes down. So this focus is dead. Dead. It looks like they may have enough damage to actually end this game right now. Welcome back to day two of Bracket Play for Here's the Dorm 2016. My name is Kevin Cloakin Johnson, joined by Tim Trixler Frazier. How are you feeling today, Tim? I am feeling so great. The round of 64 was fantastic. You know, these are collegiate players. They've been together for about a month, but the level of play was so much higher than I was expecting, and I can't wait to see more action today in the round of 32. Absolutely. Yesterday was fantastic. So much great play, and we have more of it to go today. Let's take a look at these replays. Illinois versus Miami was our first matchup. We casted such great assassin play coming out of Unlimited. Illinois took that series 2-1 to one as a great way to kick off our day yesterday. And then following afterwards, we had Georgia Tech versus Rutgers. Rutgers opened up pretty well in their matchups, but they could just not seal the deal as Georgia Tech came back and really utilized their mechanics and their ability to team fight to really just pick apart Rutgers and take that entire series 2-0 as well. It was Absolutely. such a good match. And yeah, Prime Jacket, totally. by the way, was such a great player in that game. Yep, and then it was. Florida State versus Indiana. They got a 2-1 over them. Look at these bush strats on Sky Temple. Also followed up by the Sundering from Thrall. That heroic, just all day wrecking teams. Again, they took that series 2-1. And then our next match of the day, Ohio State versus UCLA. Ohio State thought they had the win in the bag in game number one, but UCLA held on, defended well, counterattacked, and took that momentum and rode it all the way to uh, a nice achievement. Yep, absolutely. Then Washington versus Temple on Dragonshire. Look at this mosh pit for heroes, but I'm sorry. We're going to get you back with the most devastating devouring maw of the day. Destroyed. That was incredible. Washington goes on to take that whole series 2-0 and such good coaching coming out of Kawhi Rice. Panucci, these were players from last year who are supporting their team at Washington. And then our final game of the day, we saw East Carolina just absolutely dominate their matches, led by Oddish against VCU. VCU tried their best to hold it, but unfortunately it was just not enough. East Carolina took that series 2-0 as well. Tim, Oddish. Oddish was a surprising player for me. She stood out way above anyone else there. You could tell that her team was built around her and yeah. her play. The Stitches play in particular was very, very strong. I, I mean, those hooks were literally like pixel perfect. Yeah. She was getting them at absolute... And it was always a setup, too. Yeah. Most Stitches players kind of just throw out the hook and try to go for the miracle. It was, she always would maneuver two or three steps and be like, yeah. I can't miss this. Yeah, and her team, her team clearly has practiced to, around capitalizing on those hook yeah. grabs, and they did such a good job. That was a devastating matchup for sure. Okay, guys, well, we have a lot of information to share with you we have been basically crunching stats on everything that you've submitted via your bracket challenge let's take a look at this because we had some crazy upsets yesterday in the round of 64 take a look at this top predicted teams to win via the bracket challenge at heroes of the dorm.com arizona at the top percentage to advance to round of 32 72 percent 10 percent chance to win but let's Wait. call out Kevin, did yeah. red mean they got knocked out? Red mean Cal they Berkeley got lost? Assassinated. How did I miss that? Dude, my bracket's <laughs> ruined. The returning champs from last year, Cal Berkeley got knocked out. And you guys, just like us, predicted them to advance not only to the round of 32, but to win it all at 8% overall. That was the biggest upset from yesterday. And of course, Wow, we're going to get into that and talk about it a little bit more later. Also, Waterloo falling out. Yeah, too. Waterloo was the top left. ranked number one seed out of the north, and they got destroyed in their first game uh, against uh, Texas Tech, actually, who was the 16th seed out of the south. So, again, another huge upset. That was a 2 0 victory by them. And again, also, that was a 2 0 victory over Cal Berkeley. Wow, I can't believe Waterloo and Cal Berkeley being taken out. Now, of course, Arizona State did uh, win their matchup because they're the best team in the world. You know, pure bias fanboy here, but yeah, they did really, really awesome. Um, gosh, I can't believe that actually happened. Yeah, I'm I know. still like shocked because I had Cal Berkeley going all the way to the Heroic Four because oh, I wanted the 2015 finals to be in the semifinals this year. Tim, my bracket 
is in shambles. You got 12 points. It's like a graveyard. It. It's like a yard sale, as if like everything just exploded. <laughs> like there's there's stuff everywhere. I think I'm sitting at like 240 points, but I had so many teams knocked out in round of 64 that I was predicting to go on. It just devastated me. So, uh, but let's take a little closer look. Actually, let's go ahead and move through all the brackets. Give you a quick update on what all is going on. There's that upset in the top. Waterloo knocked out by Texas Tech. This is actually a game we're going to cast in the round of 32. Texas Tech, Washington. Uh, we'll see that a little bit later in the day. And then of course, uh, dropping on down, UC Irvine took the victory over Rochester Tech and uh, Illinois over Miami. Those uh, Illinois-Miami game, we casted that yesterday as we showed you those highlights. Yeah, there. we'll be uh, actually following Irvine and Illinois today. That's a matchup of the day that I'm looking forward to. I think it'll be one of the best. Here in the lower bracket here for the bottom half, we had Tennessee make it over uh, Illinois-Chicago. Buffalo will be facing off against them. Assumption College and LSU will also be doing battle. And Assumption College, by the way, has been dominating their Great matches. Place. Yeah. Uh, let's go ahead and start moving to the B bracket. We'll figure out what exactly is going on in that realm as well. So here we go. Arlington Dark Blaze did make it through. The number one seed is showing up, and UCLA will be their opponents. Yep, and then moving even farther down, Carlton over Santa Clara. We're going to see that game first. This will be our first match of the day. Tim and I will be casting. UT Dallas took their win over Maryland. Let's drop even further down in bracket B, the bottom portion of that. Boston College, we predicted them to win and move forward, and they did just that. Western Washington as well. Actually, I think most of bracket B was pretty uh, un upset, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Uh, everything we expected to happen did. Utah moved forward over Michigan, and John Hopkins over Texas A. The button mash. I That's can't right. wait to watch our games. Awesome team name there. UConn, Oregon uh, went through. UConn was, a, was able to move forward. The Tricky Turtles are keeping up with it. They will be going against Indiana, the Mighty Churros. Also on their side, Ohio State versus Temple. I am out. Owls um, will be doing a uh, battle as well. Yep, absolutely. And then, of course, uh, let's move on down. This was that big upset. The returning champs from last year, Cal Berkeley, taken out by the 15th seed in the East, Harvard. I mean, I gotta see what's in that Harvard play, man. They yeah, didn't what, just, what, what's in their water? Dude, they How didn't are they just beating win. them? It wasn't like a 2-1 thing. They 2 owed these. They 2 owed them. They're like, all right, cool, next match, yeah, please. Uh, crazy. Indiana over over North Texas, moving on to face Harvard. Then this was another upset. Upset. Michigan, South Florida. South Florida took that win over Michigan. We did not expect that. They moved on another terrible uh, demise to my bracket. And uh, San Jose State took their win over George Mason. All right, let's move down to bracket D. Arizona State, the real dream team. The number one seed did win their matches too. Oh, they did play some Kerrigan, I heard. They'll be playing against yeah. Laval next today. Penn and Cal Poly Ponomona will be playing as well later on. On the other side of the bracket, we have our final matchups that we'll be seeing. I did hear that Toronto did move forward, so they uh, did pretty well as well. Yeah, let's drop on down for the last look at these teams and their matchups. Toronto advancing over, U over Utah. East Carolina over VCU. We cast that match yesterday if you want to catch the replays. Georgia Tech moves over Ruster, Rutgers, again, uh, a, a game that we cast. So check those out if you want to see the VODs on YouTube. Minnesota over Nevada. Obviously, interesting situation here in the round of 32, but let's turn our attention to our first game. Carlton, Ember Collegiate, and UT Dallas, Team Revoke. Tim, talk to me about these teams. Both teams have not had a loss, so it'll be interesting to see what Unstoppable Forces will do when they collide with each other, and they will do so in our next game. Carlton is a team that has a couple of great players that I'm looking at. Fitzy is a team captain, actually, for Carlton. He takes the game as an approach of a macro style. He looks at the game as a whole. How do we win? How is our strategy going to be played out? When it comes to actual roster, Fitzy is leading a very strong A-team lead up. The major player here, though, is Batuti down there in the bottom yeah. right corner. Um, his Stop teammates mentioned that this guy, when he needs stuff to get done, you put the hero on him, and he'll get it done every single time. So we'll be watching for Patuti and, of course, Fitzy to make the plays as necessary. And then you see Cadaverick, ABT, and Wolfgear uh, really making that roster. Apparently, right their team song is a minnow by Era. A minnow. Fact. That's, a fun, that's a fun music video. <laughs> Moving over to UT Dallas. This is Team Revoke's captain, Aquota. Aquota is a solid flex damage dealer. We saw him yesterday in the round of 64 playing on Zeratul and Falstad. In fact, their whole team, if we take a look at their roster, um, is full of basically players who will play any role. This yeah. this team actually probably has the most flex out of any we any we have cast thus far in Heroes of the Dorm. Uh, we don't see a lot of consistency out of the heroes that they choose outside of Zardin. That is their, their support player. They clearly have him set in uh, a comfort role as support, so we will be seeing Zardin pick that up. And of course, we do know Sundead seems to heavily favor Zagara play. If we see Zagara available in the draft, we're probably going to see Sundead pick it up, auto-lock that in. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of Zagara play by a lot of teams just because of how strong the creep tumors are for teams that 
are untrained, right? right? We haven't seen anyone actually go out of their way to clear creep tumors. That's one of the ways that you break Zagara down. So hopefully we'll see more of that as we advance to the round of 32. But yeah, you're right about UT Dallas. They're very flexible. In terms of the last eight games, they've played over 17 different heroes. Mm -hmm. They're picking different heroes, they're making it work, and they're showing that they're flexible and they can win no matter what they pick. And I have to say, I looked at their games from the round of 64. Uh, they had a 2-0 victory mm -hmm. over uh, Maryland. So it was very, very solid and their play was so clean. It was basically like watching them execute strategies without any hiccups. So, you know, um, if they continue Chris. there, yeah, Chris play, very solid. So going into this matchup, um, I'm really interested to see if they can hold on to that uh, consistency of play. Um, obviously, though, these teams are looking pretty fairly and evenly matched. Um, Carlton as well had a 2-0 victory in their round of 64. Yeah. Uh, they had a four level lead in game one. So very dominant play out of them. Uh, I think it's going to be a pretty awesome and interesting matchup. Yeah, I want to watch Carlton because just reading through Carlton, we sent them a few questions, get an idea of what their mindset is going into the game. And they seem very, very serious, but they always ended a sentence after being serious with something a little bit funny. Um, you know, actually talking to Patuti, he mentioned that winning this tournament would change my life. It'd be great. Basically, I would never have to eat noodles again. <laughs> so I giggled a little bit <laughs> on that guy. And then, of course, um, uh, Kavarific said, there's a 100% chance that there is a 50% chance that we'll win this game. <laughs> Just okay. a, a great group of people <laughs> that obviously have skill, but also understand that, you know, this tournament's all about fun and being together. Yep, and of course, our first games today will be played on Cursed Hollow, one of our oldest and, I guess, most played-upon battlegrounds in Heroes of the Storm. Teams love to play on this battleground because uh, they've had a lot of opportunity to basically flex its... Uh, uh, possibilities. Strategy is pretty well uh, designed around here. There's a lot of opportunities to employ different strategies on this map, but of course, mercenary camps available to these teams, but ultimately it's really about the objective on this map and playing around it. That objective is built around tributes that will spawn around the map. Collect three of these tributes and you will curse the opposing team, which essentially means their minions will drop to one health, their towers will stop firing, uh, and basically create a very huge window for the opposing team to, to take advantage of it. The question is, will they take advantage of it? Are they ready? Are they prepared to do that? Uh, we'll see. Because sometimes you can get these curses that take place, uh, but teams don't capitalize very well. Yeah, there's different strategies that are available on this battleground. And Dallas is looking out here as this is their favorite map, one that they win on often. The only uh, They had four people, I believe, on their roster mentioned. Cursed All is our favorite, and then we right. had the fifth one say, yeah, I guess Infernal Shrines, just to throw in something a little bit different. So Dallas will definitely be enjoying playing on this battleground. And here is the heat map. You're going to see a lot of aggression happening in these areas because the tributes do spawn. So that's why you see huge blobs of death because you do have to, of yeah. course, take out your opponents and grab those tributes. So. Of course, this heat map uh, is basically a heat map of kills, deaths that have happened on this battleground in Heroes of the Norm. So yeah. this is actually relevant to this tournament alone, basically. And then, of course, the strategy of grabbing the golems are in these uh, top right and bottom left corner. You will see teams often decide when to grab those, usually after a team fight. Or, of course, with Cursed Hollow being such a big battleground, you occasionally will see some sneaky bosses. Sneaky bosses are sneaky. always a possibility. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, I, I think this is going to be an interesting matchup. I think we should ask Jose. Jose, who do you think is going to take this one? Yeah. Okay. Carlton? All, All right. right. Jose, our sound guy. Jose's a fan. For you at home that don't know who to put up, <laughs> join. Jose, he's quite the bandwagoner. He's very, very good at jumping onto it. Carlton Jose's is awesome. the pick. We love how Jose. He's All right. Jose's with Carlton. How about you, Tim? Who are you thinking? <laughs> I don't know, man. I want to see game number one first. I'm kind of leading towards Dallas just a bit, just because of stats. Uh, we've seen them do a few things here and there. They're insane when it comes to taking down opponents. Um, but I'm going to reserve judgment until game two, and sure. then I'll let you know who I'm picking. Now, we haven't seen a lot of like crazy hero picks out of these teams thus far. Yeah. Um, do you think they could have some pocket strategies, or or, or do you think they're going to play pretty consistent? Yeah, it's such an interesting here. thing. With Dallas being so flexible, we do know that he wants Zagara, right? Yeah, the absolutely. Sundead will pick Zagara no matter what. He loves the creep tumor. So that means Carlton, if they've been paying attention and sure. Researching their team, you know, they've only had 12 hours, I believe, before their matches to actually do yeah. a lot of research. But if they can isolate that Zagara is picked often and ban that out, it could be a huge advantage for them. Well, let's jump into the draft and take a look. Let's see exactly how they plan to execute strategy here on Game 1, Cursed Hollow, Round of 32. And immediately we see that Zul ban coming out from Carlton, one of our newest heroes. He has such a presence in lane, he basically can control a whole lane by himself and uh, have a lot of priority there. Li Ming being the first ban out from UT Dallas. They do not want to play against the Wizard. Yeah, both these heroes just excel in certain roles that are roles that you don't want to deal with if you don't understand how to deal with them right away. So a Zul and a Li Ming ban is fine. False that'll be picked here for Carlton. Picking up that global presence. And of course, Mighty Gust, we've seen it time and time again. Um, teams kind of tunnel vision a little bit in this collegiate tournament. So if you can get Mighty Gus, you can really mess up with that tunnel vision and really throw people off base. I think that was a smart ban by UT Dallas, by the way. I know that yesterday Fitzy spent a lot of time on Li Ming. 
So we know he is very comfortable on that hero, and I think that's pretty smart. Maybe this is UT Dallas showing their signs that they did that research you talked about. They watched their replays, and they know if we can take Leeming away, we're going to set Fitzy a little bit back on a hero that he's not as comfortable with. Zagara, of course, that pickup we knew was going to happen from UT Dallas. We knew that if Sundead could auto-lock that hero, he would. There we see it. First pick, ultimate priority by them. And this is where we start to figure out what UT Dallas is going to do. I want to see the first three picks before we find out what their strategy is going to be. Um, Zagar is one of those heroes that kind of can fit in a lot of team comps yeah. pretty easily. Even poke comps, so you can drop a Hydralisk to stay away, stay near her healer. And of course, working auto attacks based on how her creep is. So Jaina will now be picked up. Dallas starting to lean a little bit more towards damage, it looks like. Um, we're going to see what exactly Carlton will follow up here. But you want to be able to grab heroes that can get on top of Zagar and Jaina here. Yeah. They don't really have mobility in terms of escaping. Thrall is a good pick here. I maybe want to see a Johanna. Uh, Johanna does take a decent amount of damage from Zagara's Hydralisk, but with teamwork, you can get rid of that pretty quickly. And Lenara is actually the pickup right. here for Carlton. Yeah, absolutely. Lenara with so much poke damage, she can sit around those tributes, tributes from afar, poke at them with Thornwood Vine, get her poison stacked up, which can eventually just add so much stress and healing pressure on the opposing team that uh, it can basically have teams dismantle them slowly as she picks away at them. And of course, uh, Nature's Toxin is her trait. Anytime she deals damage, she, she puts a poison stack. You can see those little green uh, leaves that sort of uh, will show up at the feet of the heroes, which shows how many stacks of poison she has assigned to them. Um, that, that poison will tick over time and just deal damage consistently. If she puts poison on multiple heroes, it adds a ton of healing pressure, healing stress on the opposing team. It just whittles them down. It, it's so yeah, stressful totally. to deal with. And Lenara also, the Wisp was the other ability that she had, is very strong in Cursed Hall. We've seen a lot of teams picking her up just for that talent alone. She's, they're checking bushes uh, by dropping her Wisp in areas of you would normally see ganks come from. Now, Zagara and Jaina uh, will be the picks here. The second bands will be Stitches and Zeratul. Zeratul is actually a hero that Carlton's picked up a few times, so uh, Dallas has actually done their research. Yeah, for sure. And of course, Murden, the warrior pickup from Dallas. We saw Murden all day yesterday. Actually, most of this draft has been pretty consistent to what we've seen in Here's the Dorm, but here he is. This dwarf is very powerful. Of course, we've seen a lot of Avatar play out of teams thus far. Avatar, uh, just such a tanky hero. It allows him to stay in the fight, uh, have increased um, sustain in these huge team fights. It just makes him the warrior, the tank that you want out of someone in the front line. Yeah, he's very generalized. For anyone that might be a little bit new to Heroes of the Storm, like these teams have only been playing together for about a month. If you put someone on a murder and you most of the time don't have to deal with healing or really working with them too much, he has a kit that allows him to stun people out that are important. Uh, so he's just a great solid pick up for a lot of teams. Now, yeah. Uther will be the follow-up here. I like the Uther pick. Uh, very, very helpful. You need to be a bit careful with your Wave of Light. Yeah. Although it is a multi-target heal, it's not quite the healing you need to really deal with Lenara's damage. If yeah. he hits more than two or three targets, Uther will start stressing out a little yeah. bit. Interesting to see them go with Uther when they knew they are going to be facing Lunara. Uh, you know, if Carlton can really play well on that hero, they're going to stress that Uther out. Uh, like you said, uh, sure, Uther can hit multiple targets with his healing, but really, he's a single target healer at the core. And uh, we'll see how they how they handle that. They walked into that though with their healing. Uh, they had an opportunity to take some of these healers with a broader team heal, so maybe they feel confident going into that. Of course, on the Carlton side, there's that Joanna pickup you talked about, and then Karazim for the support, uh, uh, just a solid support. We saw some Karazim play yesterday, so nice work out of them. And then the last pickup, I actually I didn't catch that. What was will be Sonya. Sonya, okay. Wonderful great. Sonya. We saw a few leaps yesterday, actually. I, don't, I think this will be a Wrath uh, pickup, though. It's very, very strong against Thrall and whatnot. Whenever yeah. you do get stunned out, you break out that Wrath and then just move forward and do whatever you can. Uh, Sonya also does chunk Johanna pretty quickly if Johanna is being a little bit too advantageous and pushing into the opposing team too much. Sonya can walk up and drop slams. So yeah. Good pickup. So nothing too crazy out of these drafts. Uh, solid pickups by them. We know that, uh, we, that basically there were some bans on heroes that we saw play. Uh, Carlton did an incredible or a smart ban on Zeratul. We saw Spencer Greb playing that a lot yesterday, getting a a lot of value out of Void Prison. Uh, we also saw UT Dallas banning uh, Lee Ming, like we talked about earlier. So I think it, it proves both of these teams have at least looked at the play from their opponents. They saw yep. what was working to their advantage in the round of 64 and are trying to counter that. Um, but they're also playing it safe, choosing heroes that they're comfortable on. Um, and so we'll see. If you're out there, we want to hear what you think, though. You saw the draft. Who do you think is going to take this game? Is it going to be Carlton from Ember Collegiate? Head on over to Twitter, use the hashtag Heroes of the Storm, and vote for Carlton if you want that. Hashtag vote Carlton or UT Dallas, hashtag vote UTD. We want to see what you think. We'll get those poll results and share them in the middle of the game. Uh, yeah. I'm interested because this is the first time we've actually seen Sonya for UT Dallas. They have not played Sonya yet, so I'm oh. actually interested to see how they're going to play it here with a double warrior comp. Well, the game is ready to go. Let's jump into it. It's going to be Carlton versus UT Dallas. All right, here we are on Cursed Hollow, home of the Raven Lord, and this is it, the blue team. Carlton Ember Collegiate, ABT on Falstad, Cadaverific on Karazine, 
Fitzy on Lunara, Patootie with Johanna, and the last hero was on... Oh, those were incorrect. Those are incorrect, well, Tim, and which correct. is why well, I think the sub the with on there. <laughs> yeah. uh, so very far right here, we're going to see our red team led by this team captain, Aquata. Of course, players here, Zardit, Dead Fear, Nero, and Sun Dead bringing in the action. So let's bust it out, man. So just uh, really, really quick, this comp has a very strong front line with Sonya and Murd, and they can really get in there and yeah, apply the damage. Fair. The main targets for this team are going to be Lanara and uh, Falstad. Luckily for Carlton, they are running Johanna. Johanna can be quite a pain in the rear. Uh, if Sonya and Murdy get a little bit too aggressive, Thrall can chunk people down, especially Sonya if they're able to hit a really solid sudden ring and they just focus. So um, this is going to be quite a, a fight, if you will. Yeah. Um, I'm actually very curious to watch the Johanna player, how she gets into her engagements and what she does in the fights to help our team out. Both teams trying to look for that early pick, moving together as a unit, and here we see the early engage. Uh, oftentimes we can see a hero get picked off here if they're out of position, but both teams doing well to stick close together and uh, settle in in these initial moments of the games. We'll watch how they move into their lane strategy. It looks like Falstad is starting to head towards the top lane. Zagara, of course, typically seen in that top lane, so we're going to see a falstad Zagara matchup there and then probably see, uh, yeah, what looks to be uh, Jaina and Lunara. No, no, it's Johanna, sorry, in the mid lane for Ember Collegiate and then, of course, three heroes on the bottom lane for Team Revoke uh, matching up against Thrall. Yeah, usually you put a, a, a put three people in one lane on this battleground so you can put some pressure and see if the opposing team will go ahead and defend it. But the idea here is to push this lane as hard as you can and grab a turret if you uh, can before the first tur the first uh, actual shrine because you could potentially get to close to level four, especially if you pick up one or two kills. So uh, you see the aggression happening here from UT Dallas. In fact, they're actually rotating heavily between the bottom and mid lane. Yeah, a nice rotational play by them. We have a little bit of a gank squad going out looking for someone uh, to pick off. But of course, Johanna, not necessarily the ideal target for a gank like that. Uh, she's just so beefy, so much resilience in that tank. So uh, not exactly an ideal scenario for them. But. Yeah, especially with Karazine, uh, help out with the heals and the uh, mobility. He can actually dash in, give her a heal, get a couple auto attacks in, and then dash away when Johanna's able to escape. So very hard lane to gank. In the very far top, we still see Zagara and Falstad just really going at it. I actually want to look at the top lane and just get an idea of how aggressive Sundead is playing. He's actually playing very, very passively, but Sonya yeah. is on her way for a gank if possible. And you know what? There's a little blue dot here in the minimap. I'm not even sure if I can show you right here, but it's, it's going to be right in the middle. Um, and you want to keep an eye on that. That is Lunara's Wisp. That's basically allowing the blue team, allowing Carlton more vision. Let's watch. Keep an eye on that if you're interested in seeing how uh, what Carlton can see. That Wisp works really, really well to their advantage to showcase where the opposing team is. So if they're missing heroes, they're going to send that Wisp to try to scout. So I like that scout, actually, because yeah. most teams will grab Giants early so they can get pressure on a lane when the uh, Shrines are about to spawn around this time. Between two and three minutes, you usually see it spawning. Um, so they can find out if there's any pressure over there, and they can invade if they would like to, or they can position aggressively to catch them on the rotation into the uh, Shrine. First tribute, tribute. first tribute is spawning, of course. This first tribute, uh, obviously important. Every piece of the objective. The bush oh. rats, Lunara taking some damage. There will be a quick heal there from uh, Karazim and barely saves him. But now we have one member chunked away yeah, from this fight. Thrall tried to come over here and sneak uh, this this uh, tribute, unfortunately unable to do so. Uther will grab it though, and that bush strat was just enough to get this team in a situation where they can start poking away. Patootie waiting in. It is looking like Carlton wants to contest this tribute, but Lunara, what are you doing? Oh no! She was at half health. I'm not exactly sure why she felt so confident waiting in that deep. Uh, just seemed like some odd positional awareness, and of course they lose Karazim too. That's two heroes down. This is definitely a tribute that's going to go to UT Dallas. So they get a good start off. One tribute, but of course not the end of the world. They have to get three to secure that curse, uh, but Carlton Gotta start paying attention to their positioning, especially with a fragile hero like Lunara. She, she just can't be waiting in like that. Yeah, to be fair, when you're playing Lunara, you do feel a little confident that you're able to outmaneuver your opponents because you do have mobility. But if you get stunned out, you're going to see how quickly you're taken down. Uther had prime positioning there. And uh, if that is the story of the game throughout the uh, entire match, we're going to have a hard time here for Carlton. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, especially when, when you're at half health like that, it, uh, it just makes the, the decision even more tricky. Uh, so we're seeing these teams settle back into the XP game here in each of their lanes, just soaking minion experience. Uh, and honestly, that has been pretty even thus far. Yep, moving towards level 7 here. The teams, again, even experienced, as Kevin did mention, uh, but we do have the slight lead towards UT Dallas as so they were able to grab that tribute. Remember, you want to get a total of three here so you can grab the curse, which will allow for you to push pretty heavily as all minions will go down to one HP, and turrets will also not have any ammo. Second tribute spawning here in the lower left as both teams looking to rotate a little bit. Of course, that false stat in the top, he can fly in at any moment, so no worries that he's taking his time up there in the top lane. He still can be here at a moment's notice, but both teams looking to contest this tribute somewhat 
but feeling each other out. How much do they want to push this? Wolfgar going in for the channel. They're just sort of oh, wow. poking. Let's see. There's that false step with the fly. And the engagement on the quota. Quota whirlwinds out the back. But uh, playing it safe still, too. Two stacks of poison up on Dead Fear there from Lunara. And, you know, no one really wants to fully commit just sort of dancing around this tribute right now. Yeah, in terms of poke, Thrall is the only real poke here with, uh, with besides from False Ed's Q. Uh, Lenara turns on around level 10 when she gets that Thorwind Vine, so you only see two people trying to poke here. And with the heals from Uther, it's just enough right now for uh, Zarda to really help out these fights. So you're going to see UT Dallas try to pressure in. Here comes Petunia, nice though, with condemn. a nice condemn. Oh, so people. much Raw damage. It's just focused immediately there. Sonya still moving forward here. Aquata just believing in his teammates. Moving forward, Cadaver low on HP. Dead does land the Storm Bolt. But with uh, Dura a little bit low here and a quad low on HP, you're going to see them peel back. Ash Patootie Whoa, coming in and getting two just kills. Saying, you can't treat my team that way. <laughs> getting the kills, but still looks like UT Dallas is going to have positional uh, opportunity here on this tribute. But Fitzy flirting with the idea. I think they should let this one go, yeah, though. Fitzy, just regroup. Just walk away. Fitzy, please. don't do it, no, man. Fitzy, careful. Don't, don't, Thank, you. Don't. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, again, Carlton just is not going to have the actual fighting abilities until they hit level 10. Right now, with Double Warrior available for Dallas, they have Murd and Asanya. They can really force fights. And they have Jaina and Zagura that can apply the damage. Jaina more so. Yeah. With her uh, Q build, she's going here for the maximum poke, and then if she gets into a situation where a full sun goes off by Uther or Muradin, she just drops her Blizzard and Cone of Cold, and they can burst people. Yeah, let's talk about that Jaina Sonya combo. I mean, obviously they work so well together. Jaina can gum up team fights, slow them down, put a ton of burst damage down, and then of course Sonya with her mobility and constant damage and with Whirlwind. They are just like a match made in heaven. Yeah, with the fall through procs too, as well as long as she's working on auto attacks, Sonya can just help out so much. So yeah, we'll keep an eye on that. Carlton does get a slight lead in experience here as they do have false head maneuvering around a lot, really grabbing that experience for the team. Once they get to 10 here, we should see them try to contest this third tribute. But there is a chance that tribute could spawn before 10 does hit. Absolutely, Carlton rotating to pick up their Merc camps in the top left. And we're still seeing both teams focusing on experience gain in all of these lanes, doing a good job of that, paying well attention. And here it is, the opportunity for UT Dallas to get a curse. And I know Carlton's going to want to put the pressure on at this tribute, going to want to probably commit and make sure that that does not happen. This is actually real well done by Carlton. They got middle lane and top lane pushing, so they're going to have the pressure happening here. So that allows them to start moving towards the tribute a little bit faster than their opponent. Sonya in the bottom right corner was trying to grab these giants so she's going to be a little bit late to the party. But with Dead Fear buying time here, they're going to be just fine. 10-10 for this. both teams. Look at this. 10-10 happened within seconds. Uh, this so is, neck and Carlton neck. needs a fight. They don't want to yeah. give up a curse here. They can't. This is, this is an opportunity. This is going to be a team fight. Uh, they need to commit. They're just kind of setting up positioning right now. Nice stun there on Murden, but of course, such a tanky hero. He is not worried at all about that poke. Uh, let's see how they decide to, to set up here and position Dreadfear with the poke, making sure that that does not get picked up by Patootie. The uh, setups are just happening right now. How are they going to commit? Falstad and Lenar will be working their cues, really trying to poke down Sonya if possible. Patootie does oh. go in. The Sundering was rather large there, but three members oh, do get hit, hit by a blast. blizzard. Oh my gosh, Kuna Cole goes down. There's a Devouring Maul. The team fight is just a little bit better here for UT Dallas. They're going to take down three members, four, four members, and Falstad will walk away almost full health. Oh, man. That was intense. The Jaina damage is so real. You, we, we've been seeing this a lot in these tournaments, as teams will lock down somebody, and they get a great engage, and they just go full ham, and they tunnel vision way too hard. Three people immediately group up here for that blizzard, the blizzard here from Jaina. Even though she missed the Ring of Frost, right, she missed the Ring of she Frost, the ring of frost the... but the Maul did hit, but the blizzard did yeah, just enough damage. Part. Yeah, where they just work in the auto attack. Sonya walks in, does a slam, and LOLs as they actually get a few more kills, and now a boss is going to be given to UT Dallas, a curse as well, and they are going to go ahead and steamroll here and grab more experience. Yeah, such a momentum swi uh, switch here to UT Dallas. Very, very good opportunity for them to capitalize. We see them pushing with this boss in the upper lane. And uh, yeah, pretty solid. Do you think this is the right strat? Do they go in all, in all in on this, or do they really want to? Should they be spreading it out, letting the boss do damage, work in another lane? Yeah, they didn't know exactly where Carlton was going to go defend. So grouping up as five and pushing down a four is fine here. You allow the four to go down, and then they're going to group up and just go ahead and start moving down to the middle okay. lane as well. Great. Here, they can potentially get a catch on False Set. False Set is a little slippery, especially if he's being aware of the minimap right now. But they lost a fort in the bottom. So the main target here is get all three forts, which gives you map pressure. Yeah, that would be incredible if they could get all three. But they are least going to get this wall out of the mid lane. That's going to give them even more experience. And right now, look at that full level lead off of this curse, essentially, for UT Dallas. We're trying to see Johanna do what she can to disrupt it. Uh, but, uh, you know, Heroics still on cooldown for UT Dallas. While all Heroics are still up, there goes the uh, Blessed Shield. For out of oh, look at this. MD Cadaver falling down so fast. 
Oh man, actually. one for one right now for both teams. I think he misclicked his palm. He put it on ABT. He was actually gonna put it on himself there, and Sonya just working in here, getting the whirlwind. Can we get any more heals from anyone? No. Unfortunately, we did have Uther uh, walk away for the moment, but we do have Fitzy doing his best to poke, trying to work in some kind of aggression, wanting to get to level 13, but three members for the trade of two. It's still a pretty decent trade for Carlton because it helped him experience, but they were unable to kill this boss. More damage on this keep now, and Dallas, man, level 14 to level 12, just a little bit ahead. And that boss got all the way to the keep and even got a little bit of damage on that keep. That is so much It value. all stacks up. Yeah, it really Slowly does. Slowly but surely. Here we see them picking up their uh, Merc Camps right now while they have this opportunity to basically get some even more map pressure going on uh, as they move towards this mid game. Right now, they do have a talent advantage over Carlton, so they're feeling very confident. Uh, Carlton really need to focus on their XP gain to not fall further behind right now. They need to get in the lanes, soak that experience, and look for opportunities, look for windows where heroes are out of position on behalf of UT Dallas so they can get focused kills. Yeah, I'm wondering if we should have seen a little bit more aggressive play from Fawcett there, because we saw Sonya put down about a quarter health. We saw a few members low on mana. He could have ideally flown behind UT Dallas and dropped a Mighty Guts. I know yeah. they were behind a talent, but they went pretty aggressive on that fort and took some damage. Sometimes you do have to take fights when you're behind. You and have you to know make what? a couple plays Carlton has to look for those disruptive opportunities at this point. Totally. Uh, I think it, it makes sense. Uh, and Falstad is the perfect hero to try to find them on. You can just, like you were saying earlier, surprise uh, the oppo opposing team so much with Mighty Gus, throw them off their game and get those picks that you need to get back in the XP game. Well, Dallas, just with this uh, double warrior comp, just keeping up with the aggression. They're feeling the confidence. They're hitting their stride here. They have pressure on the bottom lane. They have pressure in the mid lane. And they're going to try once again to try and poke down some more damage on the support. With the majority of Carlton walking over there, though, to try and help defend this, they will not be able to establish that fort and keep it. Uh, however, Dallas can keep up with the putting down creep tumors. I only see actually four down at the moment. Yeah. Get a few more on the map keep up that pressure. They are in a very aggressive spot. Like down there on the bottom left, we have three creep that are near the boss, so they can see that rotation. But um, again, more vision is always great. Next round of tribute spawning. Carlton yet to pick up a single tribute in this game so far. UT Dallas with the positional start on this tribute. They are going to start grouping around. Uh, and interesting to see them focusing on their XP game. They do have level 14 now. They are on an equal talent tier, but UT Dallas moving ever closer to the next tier at level 16. And they are just going to give this one up. Yeah, they're... They don't really need this tribute, Carlton. They yeah. need 16 more than the tribute. The priority is much more bigger here for the experience. And then also Dallas, they understood that. They saw Thrall on the bottom and realized, okay, they're gonna get this yeah. up. They might try to come in and poke it. So what they did is they pushed out heavily and created this huge zoning area to zone out all of Carlton so that they can have their teammate grab the tribute as fast as possible so they can get back to winning this game. Yeah. Nice move by Carlton, focusing on XP, knowing not to go for the fight at that point when they are so far behind as they move towards the next talent surge. Uh, and here we see Carlton, uh, UT Dallas actually moving as a five squad towards the mid lane, gonna put even more pressure on this, uh, on this keep, or this fort, excuse me, in the mid lane. Well, Fitzy does have a Wisp down in the bottom right corner. I'm not sure why she has that there. Yeah, Would probably want to throw that near the uh, boss here as the major targets for Dallas is the boss and the fort. And honestly, Dallas probably wouldn't even go for the boss. It would be a bit of a throw to do that as Carlton could walk in there and start poking them down and really whittle them down before the boss even gets to an area where Dallas could take it. Um, but you still want to make sure you have vision on that. Yeah, absolutely. Second tribute spawning in this round, uh, this set right now, we see Team Revoke UT Dallas positioning around this tribute. They seem to be getting the jump on them every single time these tributes spawn, able to get there a little bit ahead of time, position around them, uh, and they pick it up. Yeah, d Carlton just seems to be in a situation where they're getting choked out. Yeah. And it's continuing to happen. At some point, though, there is going to be a breaking point. With oh, him. no. Oh, the palm's going to go off, but he has yeah. no means to jump to. The false thing is show up with the Mighty Gus. Can he save him? Cadaver that... will survive, but that's two heroics down that are important. That's actually yeah. a boss now. That Mighty Gus is yeah. not available. That is a huge opportunity for UT Dallas to take even more advantage of the fact that this is uh, Carlton is down on their heroics. Two very important heroics, actually. They're working on the boss, but Patuti ready to stop, waiting in. They are on an equal talent tier right now. This could be an opportunity for them to capitalize. Nice Maw pulling out two heroes from Carlton. Can they capitalize on that? So much damage falling down on Cadaver. He is going to go down. That is one hero for one right now. A nice condemn there from Johanna, trying to control the fight. Dead Fear with a ton of poison stacked on, on him right now. Can they pull this out? Equal four on four right now. Nice condemn. Sun dead falling so low, and he is going to fall. Canero staying in the back, which makes sense. Jaina, though, putting on the damage with that blizzard. You just see the health bars getting chunked from afar. 
Uh, good positioning out of the Jaina. I like that. She knows to stay behind. She knows she's a priority target. Nice, nice work. Kevin, that entire fall, that entire fight was on top of Thrall there. Thrall came yeah. in, did a Sundering, and knocked two or three members into the boss itself. The boss was actually hitting UT Dallas throughout that entire fight. Sonya then, at that point, Aquata decided to go full ham on the back line. And sometimes it's okay, but she was a quarter health and just didn't have the damage nor the healing to help her out as the rest of the team had to actually back away and resituate. And uh, Carlton now... Yeah. Getting a strong team fight. Uh, the one thing that Dallas had to worry about that with Mighty Gus and Divine Palm being down was a Sundering, and they did not account for it, nor did they see the flank. And look at this, almost an even XP game right now. In fact, Carlton with a little lead there back in this game. Uh, UT Dallas addressing their boss, Carlton addressing their boss. That makes sense. They know that each other are going for this resource. They're both going to employ it. And uh, wow, somehow we're a little bit back in an even game. Not necessarily structurally. We know that UT Dallas has a structural advantage in this pushing game, but uh, Carlton, at least in the XP style, uh, they're they're doing it. They're, yeah, that was that was the tipping point we were talking about earlier, where Dallas was just slowly choking out the opponents, and they were actually getting better engagements. But they made one flaw mistake, and they're one huge play from Carlton, and suddenly we're back in a game where it's a bit on the even side. Oh, Nara Mitzi. taking some damage, nice cleanse here from Karazim to keep her alive, but that is a cleanse down for a little bit. Uh, Fitzy trying to poke in as well, but with the Tribute now spying in the top right corner, Dallas wants to grab this. This equals a curse, which would help with that boss push that's happening in the bottom right. Yeah, absolutely. We're seeing Fitzy so aggressive with his positioning. It almost feels like, you know, as the captain, he's just he's trying to encourage his team. He's like, let's go, by, team! By being there, but yeah. he has to be careful because if his team's not backing him up, we're just going to see these losses, and he cannot afford mistakes like that in the late game. Here we see the boss from UT Dallas already wailing away on this keep for Carlton. Carlton needs to stop the pressure. They need to figure out how to do this. They have all of the heroics up and available to them right now. Let's see how they handle it. Yeah, just a little bit careful. Poke where you can. You don't want to go for a full engage because that keeps going to go down no matter what. So get as much health bar as low as you possibly can. Thrall does get stuck, caught with a storm, but unfortunately you can't quite follow that up. Uh, ABT. Walking on the side here, looking for a mighty gust. Sundering does go Ooh. down. Zagara is in trouble. However, Murden now taking the damage because a nice divine shield comes in. But the nice hammering ball. was well timed, and they actually did pick off Zagara. Five team members still up for Carlton. They want to give chase. However, Dallas was able to mount and run away. Yeah, in that scenario, they had to use some of the heroics to basically disengage. Not exactly what you want to do. Oh, Look gosh. At the aggressive fly. Jesus. They're trying to get a pick here on Zardin. He is taking damage, but, you know, as Uther, he is very tanky. Cadaver, though, dropping so fast. Nice palm. He stays in the game. Dead fear having to run for his life. Zardin as well. Right now, UT Dallas is on the retreat. Sonya. Yeah, got to go back. Get Focus rid of those Sonya. guys. Get rid Get of Sonya. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, gosh, Fitzy is just having to deal with the constant pressure from Sonya as Fitzy just turns around and goes full aggressive mode on her. Uh, the false dead play, I liked it. It was yeah. a, a bit aggressive, but sometimes you got to go for those Hail Marys, right? right? Um, we can't fault him wrong, even though he did get picked off. He did get his team one more takedown as well, and potentially could have had more had Fitzy um, been taken care of just a little bit easier. And you know what? Carlton's rattling the cage. You know, I, I like that. They've, they've been playing behind most of this game. They're rattling the cage, and they're saying, we're not done yet. This game isn't over. We actually have the XP lead. We know that you're close. You're almost sitting on our core in the top lane right now, but uh, it, it's okay. We're still in this game. Carlton's got to fight. Carlton moving towards level 20 here. They would love to grab that extra experience here. False deck can fly into a fight at any point as well as he's just now spawning. So we should see uh, the entire team kind of group up a little bit. We have Thrall on the very top grabbing that experience. Middle lane experience should get them a little bit closer to that ever uh, chasing goal of getting to level 20. And as soon as they get 20, they should find Dallas and try to fight them, at least start poking them. They don't yeah. want to do a full engage because, again, their comp isn't quite made for that. But if you can get into a situation where you poke someone down about half health and have a good Thrall Sundering into a Johanna Just engage, focus. Carlton could totally win a fight quickly. Here. Yeah, they need to take advantage of this level 20 uh, power surge make the most of it. This is their window to really, really deal some damage on Dallas. How are they going to do it? Are they going to do it? Will there's, they capitalize? There's two ways they can do it. They can A, find Dallas and just go for them, or B, put pressure on them somewhere. And they're actually going to go in the bottom lane here and take option B and start putting pressure on that keep and try and get to a scenario where the uh, the opposing team will one can engage. But Dallas does come around, sets up a defense, and you see Carlton say, you know, I guess oh, we can't get in there. Let's just go ahead and go to the middle lane and grab a fort. Again, yeah. it's not quite the fight that you would love to have, right. but it is a safe option and it is an option that gets you a fort. Yeah, but I don't know, Tim. I feel like that's a missed opportunity by them. We'll see. I mean, they're playing the, the safe game, I yeah. guess. To be fair, they're playing against a double warrior comp. That's true. At any point, if Dallas sees a situation where Lenar takes too much damage or ABT takes too much damage, they can go in for an engage on their own will. Yeah. So it might be a little bit better for them to play a bit more passively and just poke down structures whenever they can, especially with Lenar being able to help out with that damage and take out forts so quickly.
course, every moment that Carlton continues this uh, passive strategy or more passive strategy, UT Dallas getting back and back into the equal power range with level 20 uh, right now. Red team rotating to the bottom, gather that experience. But look at this, map pressure from Carlton is going to allow them to pick up these tributes and actually get position on this, this uh this tribute and their mercs. Yep, you're right, Kevin. The longer this goes on, the quicker Dallas gets back into the game. They're soaking the bottom right uh, experience here. And you know, they don't have to fight for this tribute. They've done such a good right. job of already owning the battleground and owning the map and really keeping the tributes on their side that they're able to give up this one and get to 20 and then fight for the uh, the big important one, which was the next tribute, as Carlton will get it and, of course, get a, uh, a curse if they're able to grab it. Yeah, and how interesting that now this patient game out of Carlton has allowed them this window that will happen soon. It is coming. The next tribute spawn will give them the power surge if they can capture it. That will basically allow them to end the game potentially. Oh man, I I, I get the uh, the passive play. I get the hesitance to run in and start a fight. But you know, you're in a tournament where yeah. you cannot be afraid to lose. Yeah. If you're afraid to lose, you're probably going to lose because that means you don't go for the wins. And sometimes you got to go for the scenarios where you just put pressure on your opponents. I'm not saying go straight All up in, full yeah. fight and go in for an aggression, but find some but way check to it damage out, right? on your opponent. Put some Test it out a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Here's a fight nice. happening. Dallas though, level 20, oh, and we do. Have an immediate gauge on Thrall. We do see two members low here. The ABT is trying to take out Jaina in the back right. Nice poem on Wolfgar. He got his life back into this match. Dead Fear, though, Avatar is up. Two heroes pulled out by that Devouring Maw. And right now, Dead Fear is just wailing away on Thrall. Nice Sundering, but, oh man, it was not the best range there, but they are going to see uh, uh, Johanna here, obviously with her uh, incredible shields, she does get taken out, but was just sustained. Look at that absolute massacre here on Carlton. That is not what they wanted to have happen. Here's the problem with Dallas being able to get to level 20. Hardened shield was available for Sonya, which allowed for her to go full aggressive mode. We saw ABT go on Jaina and Zagara and get them in a point where they had to back away. They had to use um, their bolts just to get out of the fight. And Sonya got focused. But the problem is Sonya had hardened shield because she was able to sit with her team and soak up and get level 20. And this is going to be an easy victory here for you. UT Dallas, as they won that team fight, they will push towards the court, right click it, apply all damage, and get a first 1 0 of the day. Wow. Just like that, Tim. Just those like little, that. Those little windows of opportunity. Those yep. little windows of opportunity. You give them up, you lose. Carlton needs to realize that there is opportunity cost with this game, and they fought back. They did a couple of great plays because they were behind in the early game. Mid game, they had that fight near the boss that really helped them out. But in the late game, they, I feel like they just didn't have the killer instinct. Absolutely. And you're gonna need that if you want to go to the Super 16. There are multiple currencies in this game, right? There's the XP game. Yeah. There's the fortification, you know, tower game. But there's also this like, who has the momentum and who has the other team on the back foot. Sure. You cannot, you cannot undervalue that. Um, you know, the, the, the presence game is very important, XP, all of these number things are really, really cool, but like, if you have the other team rattled and they're on the back foot and they're trying to regroup, like, that can't be undervalued. You need yeah. to continue to, to steam that when you have those numbers advantages and push it even further because that could have that could have been the window Carlton needed to take that win. Yeah, take your wins and move further with them if you can. So, um, you know, good play by Dallas, of course. It felt like throughout the entire early game they were just going in for the game, so they brought the hand when it was needed. Here is a fight towards the end here, um, and you see just after all the uh, currents happening and Jaina and Zagara getting away from that boss that they were able to finish up the fight, and then eventually they walked their way to the core and just killed it off. Still, members of Carlton were not spawning at that point. That's that's, that's pretty decisive. Full team wipe, absolutely. Yeah. That was a nice work by Dallas, taking the moment, seizing it, like you said, getting the most out of Hardened Shield and Divine Shield as well. Yeah. Just decided to full tank team fight, face it. Uh, so nice work by them. They pick up game one in the round of 32 against Carlton Ember Collegiate. Uh, we're going to be going into game two here, of course. Uh, we're going to see first? a new, new battleground pickup. Uh, but yeah, first. Let's look at the upcoming yeah, matches of the day. Let's what all are we going to be doing today, Tim? Well, we got UC Irvine versus Illinois next. Kevin and I will be on that puppy. Boston College versus Western Washington will have Jake and Gilly joining us once again. They will also cast Utah versus John Hopkins, the button mashers. And then, yeah. of course, the final uh, or the fifth game of the day will be Texas Tech versus Washington. Kevin and I will be back for that one. And we'll have one more game, a total of six games being casted today. Absolutely excited to see that Texas Tech team. Let's see what it was that they had that, that took that win over Waterloo. And of course, our grand final event, actually not grand final event. Let's see what we have to do to get to that grand final event. So next weekend, Super 16 and Epic 8 streaming just like we're streaming this weekend, 9 a.m. and 2 p.m. respectively on those days. Watch ESPN, YouTube, and Twitch, and then the live event. Seattle, Washington, Heroic 4, April 9th. Grand Finals, April 10th at 8 p.m. Eastern. We want to see you there. Tim and I are going to be there. It's going to be an incredible time. Of course, it's also going to be live on ESPN2. It's going to be a night that 
nights, actually. You're not going to want to miss both days on ESPN2. A yeah, suitable by the way. finale for Heroes of the Dorm will be coming soon to you. But of course, let's make sure we get through all the rounds before we do so. More round of 32 matches coming at you. Thank you so much. We'll go ahead and get ready for game number two. See you soon. Hello and welcome back to Here's the Dorm 2016. I'm Cloakin, joined by Trixler. We sit at the very beginning of our day of broadcast today. We just finished game one, Carlton versus UT Dallas. We saw UT Dallas with the early lead in that yeah. game on Cursed Hollow. Carlton brought it back. They had a window of opportunity to go for the throat. They didn't pull it off. UT Dallas got an incredible uh, strong team fight, defensive team fight, actually aggressive, but with defensive abilities, team yeah. fight there at the top lane uh, and took the win over Carlton. Yeah, and also just when it comes to UT Dallas, they're currently one of the leaders in the kill death ratio for the entire tournament. If we actually want to check this out, we have so many teams right now that are absolutely dominating so well. Now, of course, Cal Berkeley and Waterloo have been knocked out. They did have an average kill that was relatively high here, but UT Dallas there is a number six on this entire leaderboard in terms of just taking people out. And you can really notice that when we were watching in game number one, they brought the pain. Yeah. They were not afraid to get engagements. You know, Aquata in particular yeah, just solid. went in. He I, walked in and hit slam. But, I mean, what's what's in, uh, what's in gotten into Kairos, man? Kairos is taking people out. Assum <laughs> Assumption <laughs> College. And he's, dude. Yeah, that means he has not They're died ice once this tournament, it looks like. Yeah. Uh, Assumption College, it just really impressing people with numbers. I, I know they have a lot of yeah. really strong individual players there, but they're dominating their matches, and we'll be looking to them later on today, I believe. Uh, but Assumption College is the team to look out for. If you pick them to get your bracket up, you got to be happy as they're making a deep run, most likely. Yeah, stone cold killers there. Uh, nice work. So UC Dallas, obviously, very with, with very strong team fighting mm -hmm. team play. Uh, and, you know, we're going to have to see, can Carlton get back onto solid footings here in game two? They are going to have the opportunity to dictate where this battle happens. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we'll have to see how they execute some strategies. What do you think would be some opportunities for them? How can they throw UT Dallas off they the game? They need to handle Aquata better. First off, let's look at a player spotlight with yeah. Aquata. Aquata was playing Sonya last game um, and really just going into the back line. And that allowed for the teammates, J Zagara and Jaina, just to do whatever they please. Right. They were left untouched the majority of the game, which allowed them to take a lot of people. Now, is that the strategy that they're going for? Probably. Um, you know, one of the things that Carlton can do this game is deal with Aquata a little bit better. If he plays a melee assassin like we saw last time, or more aggressive heroes, just section them off. Yeah. Peel back, deal with Sonya, put all of your abilities into that hero, and then suddenly you're in a 5v4, and then engage with a concave. It's, yeah. it's actually relatively easy if you work together as a team. Yeah, you know, and it's interesting, those devouring maws from Sundead, they weren't like the most jaw-dropping devouring maws where it was like, oh my gosh, this whole team is... Uh, yeah, it seemed like the strategy was... But they were, they were enough. Yeah, they, they were, were enough. The strategy yeah. seemed to be, hey, I'm dropping Ring of Frost. There's a big middle that actually doesn't affect the rest of the team. You drop your maw, and we'll see who we hit. Yeah, exactly. And it seemed to work, right? <laughs> we're going to catch someone in there. Uh, it's a pretty big area where you're going to be wrecking some havoc so um absolutely of course uh we're going to wait to see exactly what a uh, battleground we're going to be on and get into those drafts um carlton college a very very solid team uh, we know that they had a lot of success in the round of 64 against santa clara they went 2-0 they had some very strong games they got four level leads over some of their opponents uh, in their games so they are very used to playing dominant they've had that experience i know that this loss could potentially be rattling them. Yeah. I think it actually may even be their first loss. Is it their, yeah, this is their first loss. In, I kind of want the them to go back to their, their roots. In the pre-qualifiers and yesterday's games, they picked heavy warrior compositions. They went in for the engagement. It seemed like they were trying something a little bit different here. Um, they went for more of a ranged poke assassin type of play. But you could tell they were a, a little bit too scared to actually play that type of style. I want to see them grab more warriors here. Usually they're running two warriors per uh, comp or even running two supports. Um, that game they went one warrior, Johanna, and they had Karazim, and it seemed to just not be what they're used to. They seemed to be able to sustain in older fights. They didn't realize how quick they can die if they go that assassin heavy lineup. So if they continue to go into game number two and play what they're used to, pick their comfort picks, they could they could do well. All right. Well, we do know we will be playing on Towers of Doom, a very, very different map in Heroes of the Storm. This one is unique in the sense that this three lane battleground, you do not push the core. In fact, you cannot even get to it. You can't hit it. You have to deal damage to the core exclusively through the objective. Of course, there are mercenary camps, three of them and a boss that can work for you but even those are unique. They deal direct damage to the core. They don't push lanes. This map is all about basically owning territory and 
taking the inevitable, te inevitable team fights around altars. The more towers that you have possession over, the more damage uh, these altar spawns are going to provide you and your team against the enemy core. So it is a very different game. Tons of team fighting. This map is all about basic team fighting. I mean, that, yeah. that is the drive. Sure, you need to be able to push lanes, and if you can and you take towers, it's going to work to your advantage. In the, but the bottom line is, even if you have more towers than your opponent, yeah. If you can't access the altars and you can't you can't seal those team fights, that that it doesn't, doesn't even matter. It doesn't even mean they'll just kill you slower. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, this this battleground is one of my favorite battlegrounds to play on, and so I'm very excited to actually cast it. It's my first time actually casting this uh, battleground on a live cast. So uh, the honor for us, me and Kevin. Uh, but yeah, here is the battleground, and you're gonna see a lot of fighting. Man. You see right above there as well. But this is the middle lane and the bottom lane. There's a lot of rotations that happen here. A shrine does spawn right here as well as here, um, and you also have the Shoot shrines up here yeah. as well. Um, so that's why you see aggression there. But um, in the middle, there's a lot of rotations, especially in the early game, trying to pick people off because they have mercenary camps that are here and here. I'm going to do it a different color. Let's do this. Yeah, man. Put, give uh, oh, oh, wait, that, that doesn't red. work. doesn't work. Nah, Let's go with the blue. blue. There oh. we go. Yes. That's where the mercenary <laughs> camps are. Um, and they are very, very powerful, powerful in this battleground. They destroy structures, which is what you're trying to obtain in this entire battleground. So yeah, you'll see a lot of fighting in that area. You'll see those mercenary camps being contested. So you'll see rotations often between the middle and the bottom lane. The top lane, kind of throw someone up there and say, good luck, yeah. get ganked. But uh, other than that, it's a fun map. Of course, those mercenary camps are a bit unique as well. Um, you know, they, they don't deal a ton of value or damage in lane. They're actually really designed to siege against enemy fortifications. So yeah. if you can escort them close to the point where they trigger against the fortifications, they will deal a ton of damage. Uh, actually area of effect damage even um, and then if you can escort them all the way to the core all the way to that death zone it's right in front of damage. it direct damage to the core so so much value out of these mercs if you can make the most of it if you can defend them get them where they need to go um, that kind of thing basically yeah and now uh, when it comes to compositions I'm looking for picks here that are great and engaging. You want to get into those areas where the temples are spawning and you want to own that area. Yeah. You want to be a scary force. Heroes like Thrall are wonderful on this battleground. Uh, heroes that can find an opponent walking through a choke and picking them apart. I've seen a few KT picks here and there. Even though he's been nerfed a few times, um, for this battleground, he can work out. And, you know, I have my... My, my love of this battleground that no one else in the world will play, but Savannah's a possession. She can put right. the lane like crazy. You talk I know, about it I know I'm crazy, but I love <laughs> it. I know we probably won't see it. Uh, but let's go ahead and hop into it. Zul and Li Ming will be the bands. It is Zul. Identical bands from yeah. last game. The Zul on this map is crazy. Yeah. He pushes in so well. One of the major things that you want to do on this battleground is you want to control lanes. So you want wave clear as well uh, as engages. And Zul has both of those because he has the uh, bone prison and he has the ability to, of course, clear waves like crazy and get pushing going on, which can help you grab up more fortifications. And Li Ming. When it comes to fights, her arcane orb destroys in so many spots in this area, so you just kind of want to stay away from that. Yeah, UT Dallas just definitely doesn't want to play against Carlton's Leeming. And look at that. We see Falstad, of course, picked up by UT Dallas, uh, which was the priority pick for Carlton last game. And then it's almost like we're seeing the reverse draft here right now yeah. outside of the bands. Zagara, the first pick for Carlton, prioritizing that, because that was UT Dallas's first pick, and we've talked about it. Uh, we know Sundead is the most comfortable on Zagara um, in this in this matchup. So uh, here she is, Zagara, of course, her creep tumor's so powerful, she provides vision. She also gains power when she's operating on top of creep. Health back, speed, it, it's basically like uh, you jump, you know, she's sort of Boosted. Adrenaline junkie. Yeah. She goes full in, yeah. She goes Hot, plus two. Hunter Killer, we've yeah. always talked about being very strong in team fights, but the major pick also that's helpful here is Infested Drop. It drops two roaches that will auto attack anything near it. So it will attack those heroes that are trying to grab the shrines or the temples so you can actually slow them down and really kind of draw out a fight and wait for your teammates to show up. Wow, Jana, yeah, the counter picks continue. Yeah, they're just kind of taking the heroes away. All right, well, yeah. if you take our false out, we'll take your combo of Zagara and Jaina. Yep, and then uh, Murden picked up as the front line for UT Dallas. Um, let's see if the counter picks continue. Uh, Uther picked up as their healer again. They had Uther last time as well. We're going to be seeing Zardin on that. Um, yeah, did a did a decent job with Uther last time. Yeah, uh, it's you know. interesting that um, Rhaegar is kind of being left out on these drafts for both teams. Yeah. Usually he's kind of the, one of the higher priorities. I know he did receive a, a bit of a nerf last week, but he's still a hero that really provides a lot of healing with the, with the uh, chain healing. Um, and of course, the ancestor healing is a situation that can bail you out. Uh, but it looks like these teams are prioritizing Uther just a tad bit more just because of that Divine Shield and being able to get a couple of little burst heals here and there. Yeah, it worked for Dallas in, the, in those uh, latter fights in the last game, getting that D-Shield up, and then, of course, uh, the Sonya 
uh, shield as well. It just it worked to have. It might just say we're going to protect our heroes. Get in there and get some early kills. It might just be a hero that the support player is a little bit yeah. more comfortable on compared to Rhaegar. All right, well, Lenara being picked up once again for Carlton. It seems they are really in the uh, the the mood for Lenara as they got it in game number one. Now we'll now be having her in game number two. They have a lot of damage on this team, and they'll be falling up into stitches. It looks like interesting. Yeah, we saw UT Dallas ban out stitches in the first game. They didn't get the stitches banned in the second uh, game, but uh, UT Carl is going to take advantage of that and grab stitches. Maybe uh, they're used to playing that. I'm taking a look at their hero roster from the previous games. I don't see a ton of stitches play out this of them. This is new. But, uh, I think for Carlton this is new, but maybe UT Dallas knows something more because they did ban it out the previous game. You know, we will see. Uh, Zeratul being picked up by UT Dallas. Of course, Zeratul, just this constant sense of stress and pressure in the hands of the right assassin. We know a quota had a lot of success on that hero in the round of 64. Really strong void prison plays uh, coming out of him that allowed for those 2-0, that 2-0 victory for them in the first round. And then Grey Main, just that incredible damage dealer. We've seen him wrecking teams uh, all throughout Here's the Dorm, and we see him here getting picked up. Wow, like that, that's some solid, solid damage there for UT Dallas. Yeah, they're going for the kills. Uh, they want to win these team fights around these uh, shrines that are spawning as quick as possible. Karazim being the last Yeah, Karazim. So it looks like Carlton just is all about Karazim. Seems to be the main healer for them. Um, but yeah, Zeratul, I'm excited to see. We haven't seen too much Zeratul this tournament. He is a very high mechanical, uh, skilled play or, uh, hero that you really need to make sure that the player is on point with with playing him. Um, but Lenara can go down pretty quickly to Zeratul. Jaina is a juicy target. They have three juicy targets that Zeratul can really disrupt. Um, Zagara will probably be the major pickup. Yeah. Because if you put pressure on Zagara, usually you can get out panic malls where they don't hit the most effective mall, but they just drop it because they're like, oh no, I'm dying. I need right. to do something right. And if you get that, that's a huge cooldown. 120 seconds that is suddenly off, and you can now win the next couple of team fights pretty yeah. easily. Yeah. I, I would love to see that happen. Um, see them playing smart that way. That would be great. But uh, I think we're ready. We should not waste any more time, Tim. Let's jump into this game uh, on Towers of Doom. This is is game two for Carlton Ember Collegiate UT Dallas Team Revoke. Before we do that, also though, let's get your opinions out there. Head on over to Twitter, use hashtag Heroes of the Dorm and your favorite team. Is it hashtag Vote Carlton or hashtag UTD? Uh, yeah, hashtag vote UTD. Excuse me. Need to get the vote in there. That actually is important. Or doesn't register Super with important. our tool. Don't miss so, out. <laughs> head on out there. Let us know what you think. Towers of Doom is game two. Who's gonna take the victory? Carlton's tournament life is on the line here. I'm looking at Dallas, man. I, I loved their aggression. I felt like they had a killer instinct that I like to see in a team. You're in a tournament, man. It's do or die here. It's kind of the nature of the beast. You cannot be passive and playful with your teammates. You need to be aggressive and kind of mean. Yeah, absolutely. Mean. Of course, we're seeing a quota on that Zeratul Sundead on the uh, Muradin, Zardin on Uther, uh, Kinuro with the Grey Mane, and then the Falstad there. That was the other hero that I didn't mention, Dreadfear. Deadfear, actually, on the fall stat. And in the bottom left, Carlton grouping up, looking for a potential hook here as they're floating around. Wisp will be going in, a Cadaver, Wolfgar, ABT, Fitzy, and uh, Patuti bringing in. Here goes the hook. You usually want to come around here from the side here and try and grab someone in the bush. They actually did notice that the team did escape with the Wisp, so he didn't even waste the cooldown. But we do need someone to get in the middle lane now. They missed a couple of ends of experience. You gotta, you gotta yeah. be careful with that. You gotta manage that stuff. Especially on this map right now, like, this, this early game on Towers of Doom is all about just get your experience. Do, do your basics. Yep. Stay in the game. Don't don't give any unnecessary advantage to your opponent. I would argue before level 10, the minions are more important than actually the uh, shrines that you'll see spawn later on. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, you, you should always look for those picks. My, you always should have an eye out for, uh, especially with a, a hero like Stitches. You need to be looking for picks early. Uh, as long as you got heroes in lane, soaking experience, rotate around, find someone out of position, do your best to get some early kills, but focus on the basics. Up top lane, Zerto going in for a takedown. Going to land DW here and get Fitzy a little bit low. I feel bad for Fitzy, dude. Yeah, he's, he's been picked on so much this entire up. this entire series. He just seems to be the main target. Now, to be fair, he's a little bit over aggressive on that hero, but still, man, he's just getting isolated. But yeah, that, that makes sense, right? He's yeah. definitely the priority target for them. A quota getting hooked, not necessarily the best hook target. Zeratul, he's such a slippery hero, so we should see Patuti trying to prioritize other heroes besides him, but might as well in this early game. Uh, if you can get a pick on him early, that would be great. And a two ultra spawn in the top here, one in the top left and one in the top right. Teams will have 30 seconds to absorb as much experience before that happens. Usually you'll see teams try to get level four. Occasionally they'll even leave a hero and land and just poke where they can. Uh, most of the time when it's two alters on the first uh, actual spawn, one team will grab one each. Kind of go one for one. Yeah, it's 4-4, four, four, so you can actually see those uh, later on here as they'll be spawning in a couple of seconds. And Zagara is actually Ooh. rotating up. 
Stitch is, of course, getting stunned out. A lot of damage put on him, but he's so beefy. Doesn't matter, especially here in the early game. It's really yeah, hard to get the, the, kill, the kill potential in this early game. There we saw Zeratul slip away from Jaina's uh, assault. Such a mobile hero. Obviously, he's permanently cloaked. That is his trait. So we should be seeing Ball's a quota flank play the uh, flank game. Wow, look at that poison damage. So much kill potential out of Lunara, but Fitzy already falling low once again. We see an early kill. First blood there for Ember Collegiate. That is Carlton with a kill on Zeratul. Yeah, Aquata showed up there to try and help out his teammate and really kind of keep that um, his, uh, that ball set alive. Unfortunately, he just missed his blink and actually blinked down to the bottom right and just got picked off. Got to be careful with those as the range, although nice and helpful for getting away, is a little bit on the lower side. Yep, absolutely. Of course, Vorpal Blade picked up there for the Zeratul. That just allows him so much more ability, even more slippery. Uh, he has even more ability opportunity to go back and attack heroes that he's attacked previously. Um, so watch for some styling plays out of a quota on that Zeratul. Well, he's getting styled on right now as he'll be forced to retreat as uh, Fitzy and ABT, even though Aquata will be cloaked as that is his passive. You can still see him if you got trained eyes, eagle vision, if you will. ABT went in for the quote cold. Unfortunately, the blink was available for Aquata. Just came off cooldown and will retreat. But again, this guy is constantly having to go back home. Yeah, it's nice to see them pressuring him. Like, like I said, he's, he's not necessarily the best hook target, but I mean, you can rattle a player, you know, yep. absolutely get him, get him off his game. And Zeratul is certainly going to be uh, the hero that UT Dallas is looking to, to seize kills from. And the worst part is he picked up Regen Master, which means every Regen Globe he gets, he gets better Regen right. for healing, of course. Uh, and if he's constantly going back home, he's missing off on those opportunities to get Regen Globes. So he's actually going to have to stop ganking for a little bit and focus on working with his team to grab a few Regen Globes to get value out of that talent. Yeah, as they move towards the late game, that stuff becomes ever more important. That's how you get all the value you need for those late-end team fights. Sun Dead Aquota landing here in the mid lane against Cadaver and ABT on that Jaina. Of course, Jaina Got to keep an eye on it. That first potential worked so well for UT Dallas in the previous game. We'll see exactly how it works uh, for Carlton here. All right, another ultra spawning down at the very south here. Uh, both teams a little bit even experience. You want to get level 7 if you can here. Dallas uh, floating around. We do have Ball set in the top lane as well. He can fly down at any moment. Uh, but Carlton does seem to have the better pressure here in the early game just because of Stitches being able to position pretty well and Jaina bringing in the damage. Yep, absolutely. Right now, just positioning here around this bottom altar. This is core damage, right? So this is something we can't underrate. Sure, sure, it's not the most important thing in the world to lose this one or to win it, but it counts and it adds up. So Sunday just walks by Patuni there, walks towards Jaina. ABT in trouble, getting body bucked by Sunday. Dead Fear has to come out the back. Look at this, ABT trying to run for his life, but he will fall there. It is a one on uh, kill scenario here, five on four. Look at this, Sunday trying to go out the back, but he has so much poison damage, he will fall. It is a one for one scenario here. UT Dallas just saying, you know what, let's get out of here with our lives if we can. No more falls, but Kunuro is going to tick away. Can he grab the health pool? He is going to do that. That is nice. That works for him. But we do lose Murden in the process. Dead Fear tapping, Zardin tapping. They're all going to get their health back slowly but surely. But why? Don't go back, Dead Fear. Don't. Trying don't. to slow it down to get his teammates here. But yeah, it's going to be a little bit hard for him to do. Dead Fear is playing a little bit um, off this game, it feels yeah. like. Uh, that entire team fight was actually won for Dallas, but he just stopped damaging the fight that was happening literally two feet away from him so he could start grabbing the altar, which allowed for Stitches to move his way in and reposition heavily and get Carlton the win in that fight and also more damage on uh, Dallas's core. So um, I want to see Falset play a little bit more aggressive with his team, you know, get on the same page, because obviously they weren't on the same page after they got that first kill. Yeah, absolutely. Core damage has been dealt from that altar wave. Uh, we're just moving into this. The XP game looks pretty even, which is uh, kind of makes sense yeah. in this game. As long as you're doing your basics, you're getting the job done, you should stay on an even footing with your team, not losing too many hero kills. Of course, right now, the hero kills are relatively even. Three in advantage for Carlton, two for UT Dallas. Um, so just moving in, waiting for this, heading towards level 10, getting the heroics that they need to position for those next altar spawns. Well, Carlton trying to move towards level 10. Zeratul going in for a flank in the top left corner. However, Lenara just showed up, and we have uh, the pressure here in the middle lane just trying to keep those minions on the other side of the map. You right. don't want your uh, minion waves being pushed into you, especially when you move towards level 10 and Shrine's about to spawn. Now, I'm a little curious as to why we haven't quite seen any uh, plays on the mercenary camps, especially with Zagara's creep tumors everywhere. I know Zeratul is cloaked and can't get by there, and he's usually pretty good for stopping jungling in that manner. But in terms of mid and the bottom lane, it feels like Carlton's kind of been running the train on that. Yeah, maybe they're just deciding the push game is, is just not their strategy. Maybe they're maybe they're just saying, let's not worry about Mercs. Let's just let's just play the basics. Let's just do the team fights um, and, and get the win here. that way. 
Fox that runs in. I like the aggression there from Dev here. Gonna get the uh, Thunderstorm on uh, the Lunara, and when Zerzo trying to bring the damage, it's gonna be a quick kill. Like we said, Fitzy, especially on that Lunara, uh, we saw him positionally a little bit struggle in the first game, and you know, Zeratul is a hero that will capitalize on that. ABT taking a ton oh of damage. Dear. Void Prison goes out. Uh, Let's see how they capitalize on this as it comes down. Tons of damage there. Fall. Jaina gets taken out of, the f out of the fight. That's two heroes down right now. Uh, ABT, uh, or Patuti and Cadaver having to fall back. And that is good on their part to not throw anyone else away. No more XP going to Dallas at that point. Good news. It's still in the early game a little bit. It's only one ultra spawning here for Carlton. So Jaina can get here relatively quickly, especially with a poke from Lenara and uh, Zagara. Just drop a roach around the area. However, if Nero is able to secure a kill here, that could be quite painful. It does look like Zagara went in to go in for a Devouring Maw, but the spread out was nice here. And that's that Panic Maw I was telling that you about. Maw. We saw aggression from Zeratul. Uh, we just saw immediate panic there from Zagara. Now Patuti in trouble taking damage. Falstead showing up, trying to help the damage with Sundead body blocking. That is two takedowns here for Dallas. And now the uh, altar is theirs for the taking. And just like that, the takedown game just spiked for UT Dallas. They are now advantage six on three in that. And they do get this altar. More direct damage dealt to Carlton, even here on core health 32 to 32. Uh, both teams with their heroics. Both teams doing pretty well when it comes to the XP game. Uh, right now, like you said, though, they're getting some mercs. Yeah, they're going to do so with a major amount of heroics down. Two members currently down from the fight. Now they just spawn or starting to move into their lanes. Uh, you can kind of really just pressure any way you want. We can start grabbing mercenaries on the bottom right. They could, even if they wanted to, maybe have moved in and invade Carlton. However, it's a little bit too late now for now. But I would have loved for them, after they won that team fight, to move over and take over Carlton's mercenary camps and then get their own. And that way they get double the value. Yeah, absolutely. It's always, always better to, when you have the window to prioritize those aggressive camps because they're just harder to get to. So if the team's on the back foot, go ahead, get greedy. Take those, take those camps when you can. Well, in terms of Crete tumors, they're spreading out pretty nicely on the side of Carlton, but we actually don't have any more aggressive tumors as uh, Dallas. Thank you Zeratul. so much, by the way, for uh, actually clearing creep tumors. I haven't seen it quite yet this tournament, and it's starting to happen here for Dallas, and that's going to be so helpful for them so they can keep up with the rotations, of course, securing team fights. Yeah, it's like it's been. Uh, it's, I, I look over there at Tim, he's like, oh, why are these creep tumors still up? They that need to get exactly cleared. Exactly what I sound like. Yeah. Freaking out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, in the bottom right, we do have Greyman and Uther trying to get a little bit of pressure. They're trying to get 13 here. In terms of experience, both teams have been soaking very, very well. It's just in terms of team fights, I feel like Dallas has started getting the upper hand, especially after they got their heroics. Uh, Zagara is about to finally get a Devouring Maul back after the last Panic one, so yeah. you can actually rotate down, and all teams are good to go for this fight. Just got to make sure that if that Maul hits, it's actually valuable and not a pain. Absolutely. Otherwise, it totally handicaps your team totally. in these team fights. And these, uh, these team fights are really going to start counting here. Um, all heroics need to get ultimate value. Um, so both teams positioning. Looks like uh, Dallas just going to go for that top shrine for now. And of course, blue has a positional advantage over the bottom shrine. Are they just going to go one for one? Or will they really try to force the issue here? That is the question. Dead Fear, well into his channel. He does get stopped. Uh, actually, no, he does able to cap that. And look at that. Right now, they're going in for the position. They get a nice void prison there on three heroes. Uh, Don't group up too nice hard, though. Gust. They spread out. They need to spread out here. Yeah. So, all of it to me, people. Nice. That was pretty well done. Uh, we see Neuro moving in for uh, Zagara. Is forced to pull back because there's five members here now. Uh, Deadfear moving oh, in around the health, here. The health, though. Lenora is just chunking people now. Remember, she is 13 now. That's where she starts to really kick in uh, with her damage. And Patuti going in for a hook is going to miss. But that is a one team fight for Carlton. Um, I did like the. Oh, wow. Murden actually does bleed out because of. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, Toxin from Lenara. Yeah. Um, I did like Dallas getting into the engagement. They spread out just enough for the Maul, but unfortunately, um, we saw Neuro go in so aggressively that he got poked down really heavily. Murden had to go in as well and try and uh, kind of bolster that damage and mitigate it. And it cost Dallas actually the team fight. They should have been a little bit more patient, pull back, wait for the teammates to come out of the Maul, and then apply any damage where they could from there. Yeah. Lunara, man, she's so disrespectful, right? She gets all that damage. You walk away, you finally get back to your house. You're sitting at home, <laughs> and you still bite it. Yeah. It's so funny. He looks over at Uther. Uther's cast Divine Shield on himself just oh, to try they? to stay alive when he was back at his own, uh, behind his own wall. I was like, oh, that, that's so... That's unfortunate. <laughs> that's so funny. Oh, Wolfgar taking a ton of damage here from the Zeratul. Divine Palm, though, going to keep... Uh, uh, Zagara in the game. A quota though, just deciding not not anymore. They didn't yeah. get the early kill. They didn't get the all of it done. <gasps> the oh, that was sick. He got it. ABT showing up, and that's gonna be a Q right away there from Jaina, and that will be a secure takedown. At first, Dallas walked away 
Nice. Okay, we got Divine Palm. This is great for us. That means the next team fight that might be down, so it could be good. But then Carlton showing up with their stitches, landing the hook that I believe was blind, by the way. Yeah, that Grabbing was. Grabbing Zeratul and getting a quick turnaround. By the way, the, the Divine Palms have been on point. I mean, Cadaverific's yeah. really been uh, getting full value out of that Heroic every single time. Um, it's not necessarily been in, in uh, team engagements that have been like full on, absolutely urgent, uh, but he's still, he's still showing great team awareness, keeping his teammates alive. Totally. Um, and that, that's what you want. Well, with the uh, tunnels now opening in the middle of the battleground, we do have the teams available to kind of move on. And you see the tunnel right there a little bit to the south of this area. Uh, teams can actually just go home, uh, go to Hearthstone, and come out through it. You just saw Aquata actually show up and then blink away as you saw two members there that could dispatch of him very quickly. Well, Altos are now spawning in the very south. Only one here, so you'll see both teams uh, trying to contest over that area. Yeah, absolutely. Of course, that tunnel is a risky move because you never know who actually is guarding it on the other end. And uh, of course, Zeratul is slippery enough opponent. Batuti waiting in deep. He doesn't mind. He doesn't care. Sun Dead jumping away with Dwarf Toss. Both teams not quite ready to take an engagement here, but they do know that that altar is important. We are on a level playing field when it comes to court health, 28 to 28. Uh, blue team positioned here to defend end zone against this cadaver, though, with a long channel. He is going to get this altar spawn, and that works for them. Akota goes in to dive to try to save. Void Prison thrown out. Maul goes out. Both only get a, a single hero, so not a ton of value there. Akota there dealing damage. D shield is cast. Oh, stays oh, there. No, nice the ice block because but... of the ice block. Yeah, he ice blocked him. He went to click it, and the game actually uh, registered cadaver as uh, getting the divine palm on himself, and that's going to be really, yeah, really unfortunate. unfortunate. And Dallas is actually going to win that team fight. Uh, wow. First off, the the engagement from um, gosh, a quota was very, very, very important. He went straight on top of Zagar. Zagar was way too forward, and that cost them the team fight because she put out a panic mall. Only hit Murden, which doesn't matter. He's gonna be doing that health anyways, and there's no one there to follow up to actually kill him fast enough. Uh, you gotta be careful as a guard player. You gotta be a little bit more back and a little bit more reserved in your engagement. So I was about to ask a question, but I think that I maybe have answered it in my own head. Obviously, nice. when they won the team fight there, uh, they got the advantage. They're gonna get this tower, which could work for their in the next altar spawn. But my question to you, Tim, was gonna be, you know, what was the win there? If Carlton got the altar spawn in that last one, they were able to get the channel, but UT Dallas won the team fight. Like, if you had to weigh those, like, you know, who, who got the better uh, leg up there? Well, in terms of scoreboard, Carlton's obviously winning in just a little bit. It's a bit of an even trade, actually, because you get the fort down the bottom left, which actually puts pressure on Carlton to get that fort back, which means they could have actually moved to boss. But with Jaina and Karazine sitting in the middle on the top lane, Dallas went for the safe play here and just grabbed more mercs, which pushed pressure on the bottom lane. So it's kind of a nice even tie. I'm going to put Dallas just a little bit ahead here, because they're going to have the pressure from the mercs, but um, they're going to have their cooldowns up, too, as Devari Maul is still down for 30 seconds, and the other ones are now spawning in the mech five right. seconds. Carlton already defending that bottom uh, bell tower and getting it back in their possession, but of course those mercs are going to chip away at it again. It goes all the way onto that fortification, and then right now here we see the next altar spawn continued. Team fighting happening. UT Dallas positioning against the aggressive altar spawn. Nice move by them by the prioritizing that. Oh yeah, Void Prison is available. Nice. Oh, look at that! Three heroes zoned out. Batuti here stuck. He goes into the Void Prison to save his life. All five heroes get stunned out. He tries to gum it up with his heroic here. Sun Dead, though, using Avatar, plucking it, getting it going, but the still hook. no advantage here. Sun Dead, even with Avatar up, taking damage. They try to disengage with the Gust, but he's just trying to hold on to his life, but he's going to fall, and that really puts UT Dallas on the back, but they have to back out at the top. Kanuro taking so much damage. Can he get out with his life? He will just barely escape. There's a long... all happening down there in the middle, by the way. Yeah, I heard it. Uh, Zeratul actually looks like he may get picked off in the top left corner, and uh, yep, he does go down. Uh, so what happened there was UT Dallas actually hit a really strong VP, and they just needed to hop on top of it. Unfortunately, knowing that Devouring Maul was around that timing, they were so afraid to go in for the full engage that they pulled back and they waited for everyone to spread out. If they would have known that Zagara didn't have a Devouring Maul for another 10 seconds, they probably would have gone more aggressive there. Yeah. And unfortunately, they just didn't get the damage in, so the Void Poison wound up being wasted. And you saw them lose two members, and now Carlton turning this around, grabbing a boss, and getting heavy pressure on the core. It will drop down to a total of 16 more hits. Yeah, that is a ton of damage and a ton of uh, uh, advantage here for Carlton as they move towards this late game. Of course, the XP is looking relatively even. That is not a huge concern right now, but the, the core health is starting to become one for Revoke. Uh, it's only a matter of a couple. Alter spawns before they could seize the game. We did see them get the, the boss as a result of having map pressure uh, and owning that, able to get it essentially for free. And here we see them picking up mercs, putting even more pressure onto their lanes. But as we said before, it doesn't look like these teams are prioritizing the bell towers too much. It hasn't been their biggest priority. They're just trying to play the team fights. And right now, Kanura waiting in deep on Patuti. Patuti 
using his bile right now to gump up the fight. Kanuro taking damage. Dead fear all the way deep. Divine Shield is cast. Stasis on the ice block for uh, Jaina, but she is going to fall. That's three heroes down for Carlson. Somebody heal Nero. Bring it back. I know, Nero. <laughs> HP. He's, He's like, like, please <laughs> give me that region globe. Uh, wow, what a good engagement. At first, I was a little bit worried about that fall set moving in and putting stitches against the wall. Um, I feel like he could have actually just kind of held that mighty gust because Stitch was already in position where the team can focus it. But the hungry wolf there, Gray Mane, really showed up and brought the damage that was necessary. And they now will get a port for hit in the bottom left corner. Nice trade off. So, yeah, see, look at this fight here. We see the engagement. Dead Fear just threw Stitches against the wall, but Gray Mane and Aquata uh, just going in and eating people for lunch, taking a few people out, and Nero was able to survive. Uh, nicely done by that team. I like that dwarf toss too by Muradin. That's really solid. He knows he needs to be at the front of the fight. Dives right in. It's always fun to see a dwarf jumping into a fight. I don't know. Something about that really gets my... It's a leg strength. Yeah. It's, it's very <laughs> totally fascinating. It's the leg strength. Aquata coming around, bringing the damage. The Divine Palm is going to be utilized, uh, and that's a nice cooldown. Use uh, Cadaver is going to live, but it does hurt that it has used right when the altars are now spawning. Yeah, absolutely. And Yuchi does with the level 20 advantage here. They do have a power window. I don't know that it makes sense for Carlton to throw themselves into this fight right now, especially with Divine Palm on cooldown. Uh, sure, they can poke a bit away a bit at from afar, but they should not heavy engage until they get level 20. They should focus on getting on equal footing with Dallas right now. I did like the patience there with Dead Fear. He did not use his Mighty Gust, even though he had been hooked. A lesser player would have probably freaked out a little bit, throw Mighty Gust, Ooh. but now he has an ability available for later. There There's the Panic Maul once panic again from Wolfgar. You don't want to be using your Devouring Maul on a Zerator, or one target at least. Kanero now going in, uh, Patuti taking some damage. There's that mighty gust that was saved earlier, and now Dallas, they can heal up a little bit here and potentially take a fight in their favor. However, Carlton is very, very healthy. Yeah, you know, Zeratul, like, if you don't have follow-up on a Maul, it's it's kind of like he's going to get away. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, he, he's such a slippery hero. And here we see Carlton trying to get this channel, though, not addressing the team fight. Oh, they were able to get it down, which is great. Another one snuck There's in. The They're diving into the Void Prison to, to sort of get the protection of it right now. They know that they had the advantage, and no uh, yeah, no follow-up. Yeah, I saw Dead Fear there with no mana. Canero's about half health. It's kind of scary to go full Worgen form when you're half health with Greyman, especially if you don't know if the heals are available there. So the VP being used um, was trying to set up his team to grab that temple. Unfortunately, they're not able to do so. Uh, but, you know, overall, UT Dallas seems to be having it a little bit better here in the late game. It felt like Carlton just stole that altar, man. Yeah, like, they just snuck it. Like, <laughs> they just, you're like, we're getting it. Thank you. <laughs> just straight up plucked it. Uh, so Carlton now will be doing their best to get pressure on them anyways. You see them now starting to like falter a little bit here. They've lost their fort in the bottom left, but there's constant pressure now coming their way as, as ways are being cleared up by UT Dallas just to tap it better because they're constantly winning team fights. 20 v 20 right now, equal footing talent-wise. Oh, nice hook. Can they capitalize? No. You know, they don't have that stun follow-up working for them on the Stitches hook. They're, they don't really have a way to capitalize on the hooks right yeah, now. straight lockdown. They would need Jaina to show up and get a, uh, a, a yeah, root, essentially. A root, yeah. Um, but Jaina wasn't near that area at the time. So uh, I'm loving the hooks. Unfortunately, they're just not picking people that they can focus down quick enough. You know, it actually would have been pretty nice to have Uther there. Even though Uther is one of those heroes that you don't want to focus Oof. down, it would have been just enough for him to do it. Karazim, though, taking some damage here. Cadaver walking up. There is Neuro uh, being hooked into the area. Nice heal there from Zardent. Mighty Gust will disengage, and now they can turn around and try and focus Stitches. But with the future Bile applying it slowly, they will be unable to do so. Harden Shield has to pop by Sundead here. If another hook does oh, come Korda. out, they could kill him off. He tried to get the pick on Lunara, but just didn't happen. Now he's kind of zoned out away from his the team. Hook. Can they get it? Oh, there this it is, is. going to go down. Nice hook by uh, Patuti to get that kill. And there goes the single hero, Ma. Not so much value out of that, but if they can get Murden down, Divine Shield goes down on top of him. Oh, oh they oh, get the nice turn. Nero coming around as well. Going to start focusing down Patuti. They got to watch out for uh, ABT. If a Blizzard combo does hit, they could take out a couple members. But now with Jaina low on HP, you see uh, Sundead going for the hunt here, deciding to go ahead and pull back. Instead, they will take their eight free shots here if they're able to grab the bottom and middle altar. Yeah, wow. Look at that. Three for one in that team fight. Uh, it really looked like it wasn't working for, for Dallas, but they got a solid turn on it. I think the Maul actually hurt Carlton. It yeah. blocks Stitches from getting in position there. Oh, gosh. That's a, that happens. <laughs> <laughs> Neuro's going in. I would probably ABT, back up here, Neuro. ABT. Look at your health bar. Look at your health bar. It's really, really low. ABT finally <laughs> picked off. Neuro scaring me for a bit, but he had Zardent and Sunday to back him up. And now they can grab that altar. This will put them down to a total of eight shots here for Carlton. So and you two know more what? altars could be the win. This is the tough thing about this map because these altars essentially mean they, they're core damage, right? Yeah. So when you're when you're playing down like this and you're Jaina and you're right there, you're like, we need to stop it. We got to stop the core damage. They're going to get damage on a core. But you can't take those risks. You need to know, okay, we're, we're going to lose four health. 
but that doesn't mean we're out of the game. Yeah, you have to assess the risk. Yes. Is it worth taking or not, right? There's a high value risk, and there's some values that are just kind of low value that you can just give up here and there. We do see Dallas actually doing a risk themselves going in here. With Zagara showing up, though, it's just a little bit too late. Mighty Gust is kind of their secure here. Oh, and now Carlton and Baiting is actually kind of have to deal with two of their teammates being locked down here. Wolfgar looking for some kind of a gauge if possible. A hook hits Ooh. again. Patuti is going to take out Zeratul, and the rest of the team just needs to scatter. They need to get away from here and not have any more losses as they've already got a huge win with getting that boss. Now this is where it gets crazy because we're on match point essentially for for uh, Dallas right now. They could seal the deal, but these later ultra spawns, we're going to see multiple ones of them happen at the same time. Yeah. And uh, that's where actually this could be anyone's game. Ultimately, you Another throw hook. a team fight here. Nice hook. Look at that. Divine the body block is real. Sand. So many body blocks. Cadaver trying to just get out with his life. Sundead taking damage as well. Divine Palm goes down, but they're not going to get the value out of that. He's not going to die. One hero goes into the mall. Ice blocks already down on Jaina, but she had a ton of health. Cadaver just trying to get away with his life. Sundead taking poison damage. There goes the Gust for the disengage. And right now, one for one. Four heroes up for each team. This is uh, starting to get intense. Yeah, that was uh, a bit of a good engage from Carlton, but the problem is they committed way too many resources to trying to lock down Uther. Uther luckily had a pause button there. He had a Divine Shield and said, all right, well, if you're going to buy like me here, I'm going to sit here and be invincible for a little bit. Also got in a massive queue there. Greyman got in a lot of damage as well and was able to take out Zagara. And had that fight been a little bit more coordinated for Dallas, they could have turned that around and got a couple more kills. As Karazim Divine Palmed a little bit too early, but both teams here, the nerves are getting down to it. There it is. Three altars up. This could be kill potential for any team if they could seize uh, a team fight right now. If uh, Carlton could do that, if they could kill all four, but I don't know that it's going to happen. But this, they're going to have to stop Dallas. They yeah. have to. Dallas is actually going to have to get two altars here if the sport goes down because now five damage will be awarded to Carlton if they get an altar. There was originally four damage being awarded to Dallas, but now that drops down to three, as you can see down on the bottom But right look, corner. Dallas has already got positional uh, priority on those top two altars. Yeah, they do. Karazin's trying to rotate up there, but unfortunately... I mean, this is... Here. Can he touch this him? Is he hit him. Like, okay. they basically... This this is it. No, Karazim actually saved it, so one altar does go off for Muradin, so three points they will drop oh, down look at to this. one They're health point. They're hanging in. They're doing it because of Cadaver here making the play. Lenar was able to grab the altar on the bottom, and now Dead Fear in trouble. It takes this is damage. crazy! Two to one will be the uh, score here. So if they're able to secure a couple more kills because two members have been taken down. If they secure this kill on Sundead, they can grab the mercenaries at camps in the top left corner and win the game. Push. But Sundead does get away. We see Lenara grabbing the mercenaries in the bottom right corner. Uh, Dallas has that, to defend this. Tim, the tower. That tower was everything. That tower was <laughs> that everything. That tower was everything. And, uh, it's so funny because we've kind of been th throwing away the tower game. Yeah, uh, yeah. It, it, you know, at least in our cast right now because we haven't been seeing them pay attention to it. But that was so clutch. They made the play where so it mattered. So smart for them to make and that now play where they And now they have to ferry these minions that are on the left side to this red line here. If these minions do get over Dude, it, they, can do it. they win the game. <laughs> Carlton protecting it. No one here can stop it, and that is going to be a victory here for wow. Carlton as one minion Dude. flies across, across the, uh, the uh, field there and kills the core Dallas, and Carlton are now tied 1-1. Tim. What? What's up? That was weird, man. That, that happened, and it was a play that was so minimal and needed to happen. You get the turret in the bottom right corner, and then Karazin, Cadaver in particular, bolted around there, uh, grabbed his Q, his radiant dash, hit one minion, and hit a second one, and took out the tower, slowed it down just enough for them to grab both of them. Great play by uh, Carlton. They came together in the last couple of seconds. I'm so happy for them. Oh, uh, Tim. Cool. Dallas is, is You're probably, astonished. Dallas you. is probably <laughs> feeling exactly how I'm feeling right now because I don't think they knew what was happening. Yeah, they, they all totally looked at each other and said, we did it. High five. They didn't know what was happening. Yeah. That map has its own unique mechanics going on with it that if you're not if you're not paying attention like at a super broad level, just yeah. like even I, I got lost in it a little bit. Like you don't know what's happening from even the tower to also the fact that those mercs sealed the game for them. Yeah. They, otherwise, they would have gone full ham. They didn't, yeah, they should have cleared the minion wave. Oh, to be honest, though, they had Murd and Uther, and what was the other character? I believe it was Falstaff. Yeah, so but would Falstaff it matter? Clear it, but yeah, you got to get in there and try and clear that wave, and then deal with the mercenaries. Grant, there would have been three of them. And those mercenaries... would have been hard. They're, they're, they're a little little on the tanky side. They take some damage to get rid of, and uh, unfortunately, they didn't even attempt to do it. Game was over. So, Carlton, congratulations. Them will grab one win here, and we're going to be going to a game three. Wow, what a crazy game. I, I love it. Towers of Doom, such an interesting battleground. And we're, we're, to play, dude. we're seeing strategic just craziness on that battleground. You, you got to know what's going on. You got to understand that every single nuance of it. And so cool for Carlton to have the awareness, the situational awareness, the battleground awareness to figure out how to make the most of it.
Okay, we're going to game three. Let's do it, man. We gotta go to a break, but we'll come right back. I don't wanna with take a break, Tim. We have to take a break. We All gotta right. we gotta get our hero trailers, get our momentum down, set our heads. We'll be right back after this. Here's the dorm.com. Check it out if you need more information. We'll see you after the break. Hello and welcome back to Here's the Dorm 2016. We're in the round of 32 and our minds were just blown in this game. Carlton versus UT Dallas on Towers of Doom, game two. That was crazy, I did not expect it. Such a clutch victory by Carlton there to stay in the tournament and to win that game on Towers of Doom. So cool, so interesting, so fun. I'm still trying to, to yeah. recover. There was a few mistakes by both teams in that yes, game. Absolutely. What it comes down to, when you need to win the game, you need to figure out how to do it. And the only way to do it there was to kill a turret in the bottom right corner, which they did. And then, of course, disrupt two out of the three temples to make sure that Dallas only got one. And yeah. they did all those just right. And a major player in the entire thing that did that for them was Cadaver. Yeah, Cadaver was look. playing Karazine that game. And uh, really, I'm telling you, even though Falsa grabbed the turret down there, that was, a, that was the one punch. The second punch, though, was Cadaver showing up and putting just enough pressure on the opposing team to set up his team to transition, rotate, get a hook, and of course, win that team fight. Um, so nicely done by them. I've also got a little bit of a tweet uh, from a fan of UT Dallas mentioning that a quota is how we pronounce quota. it. A quota. A quota, as I've been saying it. So it's a quota. So our Apologies if you watch this broadcast later, Quota. We'll get you right now. We don't mean to fail you. We apologize, but we will address it going this far. Um, I do want to say you're correct. There was not perfect play uh, yeah. from those teams. Carlton in particular, I feel like the stitches but hooks, they just okay. weren't value. But it's okay. Sometimes it's you okay. just got to brawl it out, man, and oh, just yeah. go pure adrenaline aggression and just make it work somehow. And that's the fun games to watch. That's why Heroes of the Storm can be such a great team game that I just I love to play and I love to watch. Man. All right, well, we're not going to waste any more time. We're going to get into the draft here right now. We're still waiting to hear what battleground we're on it. According to the graphic, it says Infernal Shrine. Nice. This is a great one. one. We know that we're a fan of this one. So much coolness. And of course, Carbot giving the love on this one. If you haven't seen the new Carbot animation, you need to get over there. John Burton, you're a wizard and you are a genius. Uh, <laughs> All of the positive things. You're majestic too. You're beautiful. All right, so they're jumping straight into the game. Zul and Li Ming have banned out, been banned out once again. It exact looks like the uh, first pick was Falstad for Carlton, which gives UT Dallas a Zagara pick here uh, into Jaina. And then we have Murden and Thrall. So already we can get an idea that Carlton wants to be a bit more aggressive, it looks like. Uh, uh, in this match, um, less hooking and more punching. This looks like the identical uh, draft from both of these teams in game one. We've got Sundead back on Zagara, his comfort pick, and of course, Jaina going to go back over to UT Dallas here uh, as they had that pick up um, in the first game, lost it in the second game to Carlton. They're getting it back in this game, so. I'm wondering if Carlton should consider the idea of banning out Uther, as UT Dallas has gone for him every single time. Yeah. And it seems like the Uther play is decent, but if that's the hero that he's comfortable on, you can totally knock him down another level of play if you uh, get him to pick a different hero. Lenaro will be banned out here for UT Dallas. They decided that, you know what, we're getting too much damage yeah. in the mid to late game coming from that character. Let's get rid of him. And the Zeratul, we see that ban coming out from Carlton against UT Dallas. They wanna, don't want to deal with the Void Prisons or the Cloaking. Um, it is able to really mess up your team. Yeah, and to be fair, Okoda uh, was putting so much pressure on Zagara that game that you saw a lot of heroics that were wasted. Even though we saw Pretty good defense against Zeratul when we saw him fleeing. He was doing enough to really just kind of rattle the cage of Carlton. So that's a solid ban. You know, Tim, I was looking at some of the stats here on Zardin, who is the support player for UT Dallas. Yeah. Interesting thing is, in all of his previous matches, he hasn't been playing Uther. Really, then? Yeah. I, I, I think that's kind of interesting. I mean, obviously, he's comfortable on Uther. He's been playing in the last few games here. Looks like he's playing uh, Morales as well. So Morales yeah. could be a follow-up. Uh, Rhaegar as well, so yeah, he does have those options available to him, yeah. Yeah, so are. I mean, look at that. Even, He's got five wins with Rhaegar. Why is he not playing Rhaegar? No. I feel like he would have been a better pick against Lenara in these situations. Yeah, I don't know, but uh, uh, interesting to see that. So he will be comfortable on a variety of supports. But we do see the Uther pick up for them, followed up by Johanna. Uh, obviously, solid warrior. She's been in almost every single game that we've cast for Here's the Dorm right now. Um, these teams are comfortable on her. They enjoy her. And Murden, of course, going to be on the front line for Carlton. Yeah, Carlton's got to pick up some support um, on their side here soon. Um, and, of course, support as well needed for UT Dallas. Yeah, with this battleground being a battleground right, that sorry. you need to Luther. clear up minions, it's really, really helpful to group up those minions. Condemn will do that for Johanna. And then Jaina can just walk up and say, here you go. Here's a blizzard. Thank you, 10 minions. And yeah. that'll help them uh, get the Punisher available to them. Yep, absolutely. Okay, well, we will see exactly how this roster is going to round out for Carlton on Infernal Shrines. Of course, heroes that have a lot of value here are those that can get through and sustain through the fights around the shrines. They can be drawn out. They can be long. 
Uh, it can take a while to get those 40 uh, minion kills, and here is a heat map of kills and deaths oh, yeah. that have happened on Infernal Shrines. Of course, the Look shrines at those are located of uh, in the, the mid, the top, and the bottom of this battleground. That's where we're going to see all of the action take place. So, um, you yeah, know, once you actually grab a shrine, you'll see a Punisher push down that lane. So, wherever it is, it'll be going that way. It's all oh, supposed to be color coordinated. Colors! So, for that team, it'll push down this way. I think that's reverse, but whatever. You get the idea of where the opponent will push if you do um, grab those for you. So uh, looking into it, here is actually the battleground. We're going to go ahead and check it out. Look at it. It's beautiful. It's huge. It's got three lanes that's available to you. It is heaven versus hell. And you'll be seeing teams fight over these minions trying to grab what is unlocked a Punisher. Now, there is a handy amount of mercenary camps yeah. that are available to you, a total of five, which is actually a substantial amount. They will put pressure on the uh, middle lane, the bottom lane, and the top lane, depending on where you grab them from. And they're just great in general to grab while these shrines are in the process of being unlocked. As are able to put pressure on the lane, and that forces the opposing team to either deal with them or lose important infrastructure. There is a Punisher. He's big, he's got muscles, and he punches things. That guy works out. He works out. And he's he done a few push-ups in his day. <laughs> he loves to pile drive heroes. He will jump on them, prioritize them even over the infrastructure, which is unlike some of the other bosses um, or objectives that we see on this map. He is a hero-hungry baddie. All right, well, Karazemi picked up, and I want to see some kind of range from Carlson, and they are picking up Sylvanas. There okay, is. this is a hero that they favor pretty heavily. They would love to have Sylvanas here uh, to really work in those uh, auto attacks, and of course, she is so good at pushing down lanes. If you do get a Punisher, Savannah can actually aid that Punisher by turning yeah. off the forts, the turrets, prevent them from actually shooting down lanes. So um, it's going to be pretty hard for UT Dallas to deal with this. Here is one of her heroics, by the way, Wailing Arrow. It does silence anyone within that radius, so you can silence up to four or five heroes if you are on point and you get that group up. And to be fair, looking at Dallas, they actually have a hard time getting towards Savannah's. If they get a Punisher coming their way and they have Savannah's locking down a turret, it's going to be hard for them to do a full-on engage. Dallas going for that double warrior again uh, with the Sonya. This actually looks like a very similar draft to their first game. They yeah. clearly got the win with this draft. It's going to work in their favor again. At least that's their plan on Infernal Shrines. It, they're not playing on a, a, a battleground as kind of different and kooky as Towers of Dooms. I am could be. a little scared for Dallas, I mean that though. with love, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Straight love. Uh, I'm a little scared for Dallas here because they had murdered in the first draft, which meant that when Sonya went ham, Murda could follow up because he has the yeah, Dwarf Toss to jump in, bring a Storbolt. Johanna doesn't have that type of mobility. She is tanking. She can't help out with the CC if she is there, but actually following up with Sonya could be pretty hard. And we did see in game number one, Sonya was a little bit overly aggressive at some times. Now with the ability to kind of be able to punish that with um, Sylvanas and them not going two play players on someone important like, uh, gosh, Lenar there, even though Lenar is banned out. Um, they could deal with Sonya easier than they did in game number one, Carlton. Yeah. So I'm a little bit scared here uh, for UT Dallas. They need to be a little bit more reserved in their full aggression. But if you bring it, make sure Johanna's with you at all times. Yeah, Carlton as well going for that support comfort pick. We've seen it in every game thus far. That is Kerazim. They seem to like that hero. The Divine Palms, they, they are getting value out of them. Uh, they are keeping their heroes alive. Sometimes their team fighting is, isn't as on point, but at least that heroic is getting full value. For the well, most part, we saw a couple fails in the Towers of Doom. Notice uh, Kerazim's been picking up Relentless a lot, and he'll play overly aggressive so he can get stuns to hit him instead of his assassins, and then he'll just dash back and then heal whoever up is around him. So I think that's the entire play here, mm -hmm. as Karazine's being overly aggressive and trying to get UT Dallas to put out too many stuns on him. Yep, absolutely. And on the UT Dallas side, you're going to want to look out for that pairing, the Jaina, Sonya. We saw it work so well for them in game one. They're going to be hoping to dish out the damage with those two talented ladies, those two talented heroes working together to, to to bring carnage against Carlton, seize their fate, take the victory, get onto the round of 16. And again, this is the rubber match. Any team that loses in this particular game is getting knocked out of the tournament. They're going home. They have to say sayonara. And the winner is going on to the Super 16, which will be next Saturday. That'll be a great series to watch, so make sure you guys do turn in for that as well. And then, of course, after that, that Sunday, we'll be seeing the, the uh, top eight, which yep. is the epic eight. That's yep. it, uh, which will, again, be a great match. So, of course, it's all on the line for both our teams, UT Dallas versus Carlton. Carlton, game number three. It's been action-packed. Jose, give it to me. Game yeah, three. Who's we winning? We got to get it. Carlton, guys, Dallas. Guys, Just, I want Carlton to take it. Carlton. I'm really hoping that they learned something from the last couple rounds. I think they're going to do it. Jose, with Dig the it. call. Jose, Carlton. He's all in on Taking Carlton. I like it. I like it. He picks winners. <laughs> he picks winners. <laughs> all right. If you're out there, we want to see your thoughts. Are you with Jose? Do you think Carlton's going to take this, or is it going to be UT Dallas? Get out there on Twitter, hashtag Heroes of the Dorm, and include the hashtag for the team you're voting for. Either vote Carlton or vote UTD. Who's going to take this game and move forward to the round of 16? Heroes of the Dorm 2016.
Let's get in. Let's find out, Tim. Let's do it. I don't want to waste any more time. Can Carlton change their strategies against a very similar comp that they have faced in game one? They've clearly drafted. They saw similar patterns. Do they have the strategy? Do they have the resources to turn it around in this rubber match? Carlton on the left. Blue team, ABT on Falstad, Cadaverific on Karazim, Fitzy, Sylvanas, Patuti, Muradin, Wolfgar on Thrall. Let's hear about Dallas. On the far right, for Dallas, we do have a quota, Dead Fear, Nuru, Sundead, and Zardin bringing up the roster. Again, this is game number three. And uh, really from Dallas, it looks like they just want to play game one all over again. They really want to make sure that they're together. They want to hit that uh, Kona of uh, Cold slash uh, Ring of Frost into Devouring Maul combo, burst people down, bring in the Blizzard, and just win team fights through sheer Wombo combos. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, the Condemn from Johanna, just going to set that up so perfectly. If we can get some solid hero control out of Johanna in the front line. The blizzards, the whirlwinds are just going to go to town. And look at this, push strats already coming to play for Carlton. Getting value out of Sylvanas, and let's see if Dallas can hold it off. Look I kind of screwed up though. here. Blizzard does have hit a couple of members. Unfortunately, a quota has not hit the, uh, the the sphere there that would allow them to chase down those opponents. And now Carlton will get away, but they did get a lot of damage on that infrastructure. It's getting to a point now where every Sylvanas we play or see in this game, there's always that type of cheese happening, yeah, right? Like, they Sylvanas push into lane. The game, we're going to push. We're going to at least try to get one tower. Yeah, so teams are getting much better actually getting over there and defending it. Um, I feel like Carlton did get a lot of damage on that uh, turret, and them not losing a member was helpful for them, too. ABT facing off against Sundead on Zagara here in the top lane. We see Zagara up here often, every time we've seen it, almost in this in this tournament. She's very strong in the top lane, such a great laner. Yeah. ABT going to try to hold off the power of the Zerg. Falset can work in those auto attacks and also bring the hammering to get some damage on Zagara, so you can set up a gank later. So it's not the worst matchup ever. Uh, I would say probably 60-40 towards uh, Zagara. Well, in the bottom lane, we see the rotations uh, between Dallas. They've decided to group as four, follow Johanna everywhere, and clear every way that they can see. Follow their leader. She is a great one to be. Look at that Condemn. She just groups up minions. They can move them and clear them so quickly and also not be afraid of potential ganks that could come from their opponents. It's always strong to move as a pack in Heroes of the Storm. Especially when you pick up region gloves. Both Uther and Jaina have grabbed that talent, so they're just moving back and forth, grabbing as many as they can, working as a team to make sure they are well equipped to have that mana regen for later stages of the game. Of course, first shrine spawning in the top of the map. Zagara there, Falstad there, Sylvanas in support support already for Falstad. Let's see how these teams prioritize this first shrine. Of course, these shrines get more powerful as we move towards the late game. So these initial shrines, they count, but they're not the end of the world. Let's see how they prioritize it. Yeah, there is an immediate payoff, too, by getting that shrine. You start farming the minions, but you need a total of 40 to get the uh, Punisher unlocked. So you'll see teams try and float around a little bit and try and get level 4. All they want to do is put their tanks in a scenario where they're in aggressive positioning to get and engage if they need to. Yeah, it's interesting. The, the instinct around these objectives oftentimes is uh, stuff is up, go kill it. Get yeah. the objective, get the Punisher. This is the right thing to do. The map told us the Shrine is spawned. But sometimes the wise move is to continue soaking experience. Like you said, let the other team spend their energy starting it, and then you go make a strong move and clear it out. Uh, it's all about how your team is choosing to execute strategy, and you can get it both ways. Nice stun there on Murden, but he is so tanky. Kanuro, though, getting caught out. Can he be sustained? He is going to fall. That is first blood for Carlton. A quota also falling painfully low and going to get taken out of this fight. Nice start for Carlton here with the confidence, with the early kills. That's very, very cool, especially Wowzer. against this early game, early composition of strength on Dallas. Carlton changed the way they played in that entire scenario than they did in game number one. We actually saw Fitzy use his mobility, get into an engage, and they went destructively on top of Jaina, killing her quickly. They are now getting a couple of kills. They took out Uther as well, and they are taking these minions. They are so confident, they already said, hey, Falstead, go to middle lane and push it in, which is making Jaina and Sonya go deal with that, which gives this entire shrine to Carlton. I like it. They're getting yeah. aggressive, and they change the way they play. They seem more comfortable now. That's great. And of course, I'm not really sure why Dallas decided to, to give Uther up there. They're not going to win that shrine. They're not going to win this first Punisher. Better to just regroup and move on. Uh, Sometimes you get in a scenario where you're like, stop beating us. Yeah. Please, I'm going <laughs> to do something. Oh, Don't wait. beat up on my team. This, this actually kind of hurts. Yeah. Now I'm going back home. Well, Carlton now going to start soaking up the rest of these uh, minions. Now has a Ice Punisher to push in the top lane. Uh, Sylvanas needs to be with his Punisher. Yeah, but of course, this is just going to take a lot of energy and time off of Dallas as they're going to have to clear this Punisher up. Not a ton of health on this bad boy or a ton of damage, but it's just going to be a huge distraction for them. They're going to have to focus it down. And right now, look at that. Carlton taking advantage of the fact that they can get these towers down with the support of Sylvanas as well. Not even take damage uh, and get the experience boost from that. 
Yeah, and I was actually incorrect. This is a mortar here going off. It was blue. It threw me off. It's Don't all yell right. at me, Chad. Ice, ice is blue. I get it, man. Yeah, I get it. I, I got it too, man. Just <laughs> can't be slacking like that. Well, uh, we do have uh, Carlton a little bit ahead here, actually. And this is the first time that we've actually seen a major lead for a team in this entire series. Both games, we always felt like they were very, very close. It got to the, the race to 10 um, on similar levels. But here we see Carlton with the extra kills in the early game and they soaking up Falstead where he pushed in the middle lane and got a free wave. It's really helping them out here. Yep, Carlton with the XP lead for for sure. Uh, almost a full level ahead of their opponents, which is really solid for them. Got to be giving them confidence, giving them feel feeling good going into the mid game as they move towards level 10. Totally true. Well, uh, for some reason, Dallas is actually stacking the bottom lane here a little bit. It feels like they're a bit scared that the uh, Carlton might be aggressive and try to grab these mercenary camps. However, Carlton has pulled back and they again just realize they need to get the 10. They don't need to do anything risky yeah, here. No risk. Something risky. Um, it could bite you in the rear and kind of take you uh, aback from what progress you've already made and they just want to get the 10 and make sure they're set up for the next shrine. Yeah, you don't want to be a foot down or a leg down or a hero down. Actually, that's probably the more accurate thing today. You don't want to be a hero down. I don't want to be a leg down either. <laughs> or a leg I'm down. that. As you go into the next shrine spawn, so just play it safe. Soak experience. Get mercs if you can. Sure, why not? But uh, be strong. Be ready to be on an equal footing with your opponents as the next shrine spawns. You don't want, you don't want things to snowball away from you as you move towards the mid late game. Well, Carlton is actually putting four people in the uh, the bottom lane and mid lane, which means they may have a rotation if they're able to take out Jaina here Ooh, and be able to take Mercs. Yeah. Uh, Neuro is taking some damage, but luckily his best friend Uther Zardin is here to give him a heal and keep him alive. Nice rotation there, but Carlton again just sneaking ahead uh, about a quarter of a level at level nine. They're about three quarters away from getting level 10 and getting that heroic, and guess what is spawning in 15 seconds. For the Alliance, Tim, I feel like when Uther heals Jaina, he heals more. Yeah, because they're alliance. I mean, that's totally not true, but it feels like it. Yeah, it feels like it for the alliance. <laughs> well, uh, you're going to see the uh, blue team just really pushing in their lanes here, getting that experience. We have Impalers down here on the bottom right. However, UT Dallas is making a move Ooh. and they are going for Thrall. Wolfgar in trouble and he will be taking down. That is a big pickup here that for is. Dallas. They need to make something happen so they can actually contest these shrines and also get them closer to level 10. Yeah, that is exactly what they need. They're a little behind in the XP game and this gives them a, a, a basically a counter advantage going to the next shrine spawn by Carlton just trying to take every moment of advantage that they have with the heroics under their belts to get the get the shrine get the next punisher in their advantage uh, and of course Dallas not wanting to have any of it until they they turn that level 10 point, and they're doing that right right now very smartly. All right, Dallas about to level 10, so they start moving on in. They're going to try and grab whatever they can. Only uh, nine minions went to Carlton. Uh, normally, you want to try and have around 20 before you have to deal with the opposing team, right? Yeah. Uh, so Carlton uh, still floating around, working in attacks where they can, but really, Dallas is just on point with this. But Falstead now flying in will allow the team to get to an engagement. You see Patuti setting up there on the right side. Fitzy coming in from the bottom. Nice, a spread out engagement from here. They have a nice concave. Watch out for a quota and Dead fear as they're gonna have to peel nicely here. There Ooh. is a Sundering though. Yeah, Sundering Divine Shield has to go down. Ring of Frost comes out. Nice value there from that. So much damage. There's only a one-man maw on Muradin and a quota there trying to go for the kill, but his health is very low. He has to be careful because he, he cannot continue to be too much aggressive. He has to go out the back and uh, pull out. So that is two heroes though for Dallas. They do have the upper hand and they are gonna be able to get these minions and spawn the next Punisher. This will be Tim, the Ice, the Frozen. There's yeah, the one we were yeah, talking about earlier. Being brought to the battle. Foreshadowing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so in that fight, Carlton actually just didn't hit as many targets as they wanted to with the Ring of Frost. Um, the Sundering actually knocked back the Squishies to the back left corner, which put them in a safe position. And then the uh, Johanna and the uh, Sonya, the tanky heroes in this roster, were able to stay alive, especially with the help there from Uther. So Dallas just responded back to that fight saying, hey, use a lot of key heroics. Well, this means we just walk up and we bring our damage and hopefully we get a couple kills, and they did. So this is giving Dallas the XP out of these towers and fortifications here in the mid lane against Carlton. So that is nice for them. Look at this. The XP game is now lined up and on par with one another. Uh, so solid work for them getting back into this game. They have to feel on even footing now, which is nice and uh, prepared for that next spawn game. So they're going to soak experience, get in lanes, get mercs when they can and how they can. Cadaver here with the support of Fitzy doing that just now on these shaman camps. Of course, these shaman camps, if left unattended, can wreak some havoc. Those shamans can respawn uh, the support of their, their minions there. So if you focus on minions and don't take out the shaman, uh, they'll basically go on forever. Oh, we do have a pause here from Patutity. From Patutity? 
Uh, that, that, that's Patootie. not correct. Uh, yeah, so um, Patootie. going back to those mercenaries that you were mentioning, the, the Hellhounds and the Shaman, they're probably the scariest mercenary yeah. camp on this battleground. The other ones, the Impalers, are pretty strong at breaking down structures, but they are dealt with pretty quickly by opposing heroes. So you definitely want to grab those. I would probably maybe wait a little bit longer there. I kind of feel like Carlson's just grabbing these to grab them. They're like, oh, we have a yellow thing on our map. Yeah, Let's go ahead and grab thing. these. Um, you kind of want to wait to get those when you're around the shrines. You usually don't want to contest your side unless the opposing team is invading, and the opposing team is playing safe too. Yeah. Yeah, in the lands, you can see it's them interesting. On the Sometimes that feels like uh, that thing where it's like the battleground's telling me to do this. You know, like yeah. uh, it's interesting to see the difference between the teams who are strategically choosing their mercs based on timings as mm -hmm. they relate to the battleground objective. Um, how do they capitalize on it? Do they get sure. the most value out of it? Time it right before a Punisher spawns, so there's counter pressure going in another lane, basically causing more stress. You know, more anxiety on the other team. Um, and when you see one team doing that smartly against another, it really does add up. It's basically just more pressure. It's a little, a little annoying thing in the back of your head. But we do have a replay to show you guys in this match. I want to go ahead and check out one of these team fights that we just witnessed and give you an idea of what was going on. Look at that Ring of Frost. It actually only, what does that hit? One character, and that was it um, on, for the uh, Jaina player. But still, the follow-up here for Sonya and Johanna was enough to put some pressure. We see more aggression happening over here, though. This is what I'm liking about Carlton, is they're at least going in and causing a ruckus, right? They're yeah. not... They're not playing passively. They're not getting picked down now. To be fair, their comp is a little bit more aggressive than we saw in game number one as I stand up on camera. Uh, so uh, they're, they're a little bit more passive than they were, or more aggressive in game number three than they were in game number one because they had a more pokey type of composition, but I love that they're getting more aggressive this time. All right, we're back in. Things are solved. Let's unpause and get back into this game right now. We're about the mid game. Let's see how these teams continue to move on. Level 12, level 12, Carlton, UT Dallas. This is the rubber match. One of these teams is going home in a matter of minutes. Who is it going to be? It's even right now. Uh, it, it, everything's on the line. Yeah, you can see that uh, both teams are really just fighting it back out. Uh, Mercenary camps are being grabbed on the left side here as well. Um, but Dallas already is aware of this. They saw that the Mercenary camps were grabbed in the top left corner, and that means usually that the uh, team is going to be rotating down to the bottom left. So they're actually grouping up and getting their ways pushing out so they can deal with these as uh, possible and still grabbing those region globes. Yep, absolutely. Here we see Red Team just trying to figure it out. They know that they're going to stay in this lane, stay close, get the experience where they can. Cadaver, Fitzy, working on these bottom impalers. Like we said, they are they can push. If left unattended, they deal damage. They actually throw from afar. They're out of turret range, so you got to have to clear them up quick or else they will do structural damage, but uh, not a ton of health on these guys. Uh, they can be cleared out relatively quickly as long as you're addressing them. Both teams have hit 13, and now is when you start thinking about grabbing your own mercenary camps because the shrines will be spawning relatively soon, and we see Sonya actually start Starting out in the very far right here, Okuda has his timing yeah, down. There is the shrine. Great timing. This is where you normally want to grab them. You see Carlton, they had all that pressure for, what, 10 seconds? And right. it was all cleaned up because there was no reason for UT Dallas not to go clear it up. They didn't have anything pressuring them to stay away from it. And now Carlton will have to deal with the pressure of their mercenary camp on the top, especially with the shrine being at the very bottom. Yeah, absolutely. Good counter pressure there based on the shrine spawn in the bottom right now. Patuti waiting in deep, just trying to zone out the other team. Dead Fear is doing the exact same thing for Dallas and uh, just a positional game here around this middle shrine. It is just now activating uh, as both teams, knowing that this is getting increasingly important to grab these shrines, these punishers scale in strength as we move towards the late game. So this one, not only because we're level 13 and getting deeper, look at this nice uh, ice block there to save Jaina. The, the Sundering goes out, Ring of Frost gets dropped. Two men into the Maw, there for UT Dallas, and ABT has to evacuate. He is too low on health. Dead Fear trying to come in, gets the shield glare off, and Patuti as well having to get out of there. Dallas with the upper hand. They are going to get even more of these minions, and do, do Ember Collegiate, do Carlton try to wade back in here? It kind of seems like they have to. But their heroics are all on cooldown. Yeah, the heroics are actually both down on both yeah. teams. So this is going to be a pure fight. But they do pick off Zagara, which is a huge pick here. As those Hydrus' Roach is actually getting into the fight here. And ABT trying to deal with Akuota. Dead Fear will help out a lot with the uh, the peeling there. But Akuota does go down. I do want to mention how I actually really enjoyed wow. that like, three-layer fight from uh, Carlton. First off, they caught him in the top right corner, so they get Wrath Pop. They were trying to get more heroics. They got Wrath from Sonya. So Sonya in the second fight didn't have Wrath. So she was able, um, wasn't as strong as she normally would be with that heroic. And then all the heroics were beta 
wait it out. We saw Carlton go all the way back to yeah. their fort, grab their region uh, sure. from the uh, fountains, and they came back at mild health as to where UT Dallas did not. And eventually, they broke them down. Yeah, really smart play by them. I love that they were like, no, we're not done here. We got our health. We, we drank from the fountain. And we're going to go back and get these kills. All the heroics were down, but it didn't matter. They seized these kills. A quota having to get out, try to get away with his life. But, you know, we saw so many heroes fall for them, four of them. And here, Carlton with the upper hand. They've got the XP lead. They've got the arcane punisher, which we all know is the most feared of Punisher types. Very, very strong. Lots of area effect damage. And of course, he's going to be jumping on heroes as much as they can. But uh, interesting enough, we saw Carlton send back the heroes that you would normally push with this false and Sylvanas. And now this Punisher kind of gets to just be left alone. Uh, they're not really maximizing the capability available yeah. to grab this hero. I realize a few of them were uh, low on mana, but that's fine. Yeah. Just push with it and play it more of a safe manner or get your damage wherever you can uh, on the turrets and such. But just play it a situation where they can't engage on you and be fine. And now that Punisher is going to be dealt with in the bottom right corner. Carlton is pushing in the middle, going to grab the infrastructure, but look, this is already dead. Yeah, he's already dead. Bit of a waste. Not, no value out of that a Punisher altogether. Carlton, though, does have the talent and power lead over UT Dallas, so UT Dallas is probably going to play a little bit cautiously until they can turn the corner on level 16 right now. Carlton going for this fort. They grab it. More XP. That's two forts down. Only one fort remains in the mid lane for Dallas, uh, so the structural game is in favor of Carlton right now, so that's working in their favor, which is great. They're ever closer to those keeps, ever closer to those more powerful minions that can push for them. They grab these impalers. We're going to work for them. And here does Carlton as well, going for the shamans. Interesting to see them still grabbing them uh, a little bit outside objective timing. But, uh, you know, maybe they just feel like this is the best choice for them right now. Yeah, they're trying now just to get some kind of pressure on the map and catch people in rotations. I've seen Murden a few times kind of sneak over to the right and look in those alleyways, looking for somebody that might pop up. And then if you see somebody, he drops a storm boat and says, hey, team, come help. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, those have really, really happened for uh, Carlton quite yet. You see him, he's doing it again here. He's just looking for something. He's trying to get into uh, a fight for his team. But after seeing three or four people there, decides to pull back. Wise choice by him. And he keeps clearing the creep for Zagara, which is good. Yes. You clear all that creep. You get to situations where you can catch off your opponents and pop heroics like we saw earlier. Yep, absolutely. Of course, Murdered by himself, not necessarily going to be able to take down heroes uh, or at least burst them down. So he needs to be moving around with a, with a buddy when he's going on those realms. So they are going to jump in here, wail away on this infrastructure. They are going to get the health uh, fountain there and start working Good job, Joanna on coming in from line. behind. Oh, yeah, look at this flank. Joanna coming in with the condemn. Uh, Murd is taking damage, stunned down. ABT, though, trying to get get out of there to safety. Stasis goes down on Wolfgar. He is able to pull away. Lakota, though, dropping so low, he is going to fall too. Go into the Maw there for Carlton. Sundering is up in two seconds. Sundering, it's coming up. We're Where's the Sunder? Where's yeah. it at? There it is. It was a couple seconds late, but he follows up with the, cha the chain. Lightning getting two attacks. And if he hits a Wolf, he's getting one more takedown. That is three takedowns. That entire fight was. Such a delayed action yeah. for Carlton because they were waiting for Thrall to get the Sundering in. Nice Divine Palm there by Cadaver once again. Three members going down for Dallas. And now with a Shrine spawning, we can send a couple people home, get them healed up. Or we can grab Mercenary Can so we can get aggression on the top lane. Okay, I like it. Yeah, for sure. And Dallas, though, just trying to stay in this game. You know, uh, I, I can't fault them for the attempt there. The flank was really nice. It was a good flank. Up. That was really solid. They definitely cut, caught Carlton off guard. Uh, Sundering was still on cooldown. They, were, they weren't in full power. They wouldn't have chosen to have that fight. So nice to see UT Dallas trying to dictate the tempo there. Uh, it unfortunately didn't work to their favor, but that's okay. They are a little bit behind in XP right now. Um, so they need to continue to take bold choices if they want to stay in this tournament. Uh, but I like that they're not, they're not afraid of that. Yeah. You know? Well, Carlton's in a really good position right now because they have Mighty Gust available to them and Divine Palm in case anyone does get pounced on. And they grabbed 33 minions. You're going to see UT Dallas really be aggressive on these minions, maybe to a point where they put themselves out of position because they want to make sure that they don't get this away for free. Yeah, that is absolutely correct. They are really going to try to stick here, though they will. They need to kind of clench it now because as Carlton increases towards level 20, we're going to see a power surge on their part, which is going to work to their advantage. So uh, we are seeing Thrall still trying to hang a little bit low into that mid lane and kill minions while he can. He is coming up, though, now. Here yeah. goes the fight. Stuns goes out. Divine Shield there on Sonya as she wades in deep. Dealing the damage on Monk. Right now, the team is a little bit spread out, but uh, her Hel Quota's health falling so low. There goes the Ring of Frost. So much damage here. Dead Fear also wading in. He is trying to deal the damage. Ice Block has to go out for him. Uh, Jaina and, man, so much. Here we see two heroes down for both teams. It's a three-on-three -three scenario. Zardin getting stunned. 
They're going to turn on the fight here because Nero is insane. Finally, uh, Patootie does catch Jaina, which was the important target during all of that. The real important things that happened in that fight was a Mighty Gust from ABT. It did cost him his mana, but he did push away three members, which allowed for the team to focus on Sonya, get rid of her, and they did go in for the engagement, and they won the Punisher uh, tire exchange. Now, the Punisher is pushing down the middle lane right now. I feel like chasing Johanna here is a bit of a mistake. Just go push yeah. and get infrastructure here. Killing her doesn't do much for your team because as you keep chasing this uh, guy around continuously, <laughs> yeah. people are spawning. Gonna fall, especially against the Murden. I, I mean, eventually she will chip she'll away. She'll eventually die. It's just yeah. like, how much time was wasted there? I yeah. would. I could watch a half a TV show in that entire time, right? Like, you're wasted so much time. The Punisher is now dealt with, and potentially Dallas can defend their keep, which yeah. is the main target. That's what the you want to win the game. It feels good to kill opposing heroes. It yeah. feels great, but that's not how you win. Nope. You got to kill the core, man. That is the ultimate win condition. That is the only win condition, actually. No matter how you get there, that is how you take the game. UT Dallas, they're not done yet, though. They will be at full force in 30 seconds. Uther still spawning in. Johanna still needs to get into the battleground. And how will Carlton capitalize? They do have the power advantage. Storm talents are in their arsenal right now at level 20. They're going for these impalers. They're going for Merc camps. Interesting to see them taking this time. Is this the right choice? I keep getting into a, a situation weird. here where I think Carlton just doesn't know how to close. They don't know how to close. Sometimes you gotta close down the doors. This is you the can't same keep serving drinks, right? Same scenario is yeah. game one. They're playing the safe route here. They're not doing anything here to get pressure on it. And it just seems like they're so afraid of losing that they won't push in. They're getting a lot of mercenary camps here, but with uh, Jaina being available and Johan, they can kind of clear these up really, really quickly. Whereas Dallas is on a timer now to get to level 20. And look at all this XP for Dallas. If they can just clear this minion wave, they're gonna like, they're gonna, they're gonna turn the corner on 20. Yeah, this actually yeah. winds up being helpful with all of them being alive. Uh, so we're gonna see the uh, fort such, or the keep be it poked down, and I'm glad that Carlton is actually doing this. They're moving forward and trying to get pressure on this keep. Uh, Johanna potentially kicking in here and pull all these minions though into fort range. There it is, and that helps them clear it. And now this fort or this keep is only half health. Sonya, in fact, is actually in the bottom lane soaking right now, while this could be a potentially a 5v4. Carlton uh, is, has missed out on a huge opportunity, and I'm a little disappointed. The window has closed now. They're all on Storm Talents, equal footing. This has got to make Dallas feel very, very happy. Yeah, great staggering there of time, making sure to make things work out, never over committing, letting Johanna be the only one to pull minions into the four range. Sonya sneaking down in the bottom lane to experience. That is teamwork. That is how you win video games. And now with UT Dallas and Carlton grouping up, a shrine has activated, and this is anyone's game. Yeah, and I want to be clear, Dallas has a, t a steep hill to climb here. Oh, here this comes, is nice. Here comes Carlton with the aggression. They know that they want to take it right now. They've decided to nice. go into the mall right now for zoning in right nice disengage there from the mighty gust Sundering goes Sundering out. came around and split them, but I just don't think there's yeah, the ball. A lot of, a lot of heroes are being burned here. Uh, for Carlton, Sonya finally does get some damage on her, but the Divine Shield will save her. We do see Jaina Nuro in the back right corner. Low on HP. Sonya, though, going in, hitting the buttons. There's a slam on one member, two members now. Uh, we do have Johanna still chasing. Patuti coming around the side here, but the heals are starting to kick in here from Uther on Zardin. Now, finally, a member falls, and with a strong hammering from ABT, he is going to secure a takedown. There is the uh, uh, Ring of Frost. It's a bit too late, though. There is only two members left here for UT Dallas, and Carlton finally turns on the jetpacks and moves in and starts taking out members. One more member going to fall here, too. Zardin being bloody blocked. Dead Fear in trouble at the same time. Is this going to be a takedown? Yes. Four. Five members potentially going down. No, Zardent will sneak away, but the core, it's right there. Go hit it, guys. Yeah, and Tim, that was what we were missing. That was what we wanted to see out of Carlton in game one. I'm glad. They find it was like it was like a light bulb went off, man. They're like, you know what? If we attack these heroes here, we could potentially win. And I like the flank too. Thrall actually yeah. hung out in the bottom left corner and hit a very strong sundering that split a few members. I was a little fearful at first. Yeah, I felt I like a lot of heroics have been burnt, uh, but there was a bit of an overextension by the team. Neuro was very, very weak on Jaina. And once he got picked off, Zagara was right for the picking. And this is going to be a win for Carlton. They come back in the series to win it 2 1. Congratulations to them. Yeah, absolutely. Carlton takes this game three against UT Dallas. Congratulations to them on what was a very hard, hard fought set on their part against UT Dallas. Uh, UT Dallas 
com commendations for getting all the way this far. Yeah, really great play out of those guys. This was actually a really even matchup. That was a fun series to cast. Fun series to cast. I had an absolute blast. And yeah, like you were saying, that last team fight, I was absolutely world worried for Carlton. It just felt like it was uh, they weren't as uh, linked up with the heroic abilities. Like they were they were all getting used, but not, not getting a ton of value out of them. Yeah, I mean, uh, it started to look like Jose is also a prophet as dude, well. Jose! Oh, okay. You're, you're <laughs> catching all the wins, dude. Like, how did you know? Yeah. He, he's like, he's like I, just, I just know, man. Yeah. Flexibility. They were two very opposite teams, but, you know, at the end of the day, Jose the legend, man. Yeah, the legend. I should have made you do my bracket and then tweeted it out <laughs> so I looked like I was intelligent or something. But, well, so Carlton moving forward. So congratulations to them. They will be going to next week's uh, matchup in the Super 16. We'll see who they'll be matching up against later on today. Uh, but congratulations to them. And, you know, UT Dallas, you guys played great. Like, there's, there's nothing in the fault on. Both teams made mistakes here and there. You both can clean it up. You can both get better. And that's what the cool part is. You can work as a team and continue uh, to really play in these types of tournaments. Yeah, absolutely. And nice to see Carlton going in for that kill. They had the confidence. Uh, really cool play by them. Absolutely good work. And you know what? It looks like we are going to get a moment here to talk to Fitzy, team captain for Carlton Ember Collegiate. We're going to have him on the Skype interview here shortly uh, to talk a little bit about their strategies. I can't wait to hear their thoughts on the Towers of Doom game. I can't wait to hear their thoughts on this final game. Uh, talk to them about their decision to go for the go for the clinching victory, go for the kill. Talk about these windows of opportunity that we saw them miss in game one, and then finally see them just to make the decision to go for the win, go to win the video game. Right click the core. Yeah, just gotta get in there and finally do it, man. You yeah. just gotta take it out. And that's how you win. So, um, you know, I'm pretty excited to talk to Fitzy. I actually really want to know what was going on in game number one. Um, were they playing towards their comp, or were they just a little a little uneasy, right? Yeah. Being in this tournament, being in the top 32, it can kind of wear on your nerves a little bit. So let's go ahead and jump into it. Yeah, absolutely. Fitzy, are you there? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. How you doing? Uh, fantastic. Congratulations to you and the team at Carlton. You guys did it. It was a hard-fought battle. 2-1 victory here over Dallas. How are you feeling right now? You know, I'm feeling really well. We uh, we really underestimated Dallas, and I'm, I'm glad they had such a great outcome, and I'm really looking forward to next week's games, too. Yeah, now we saw you guys with Windows of Opportunity. Game one, Dallas had the early game. You guys swung <laughs> back at him. In. He's like, yeah, he Yeah, knows. you guys swung back <laughs> in with the victory, and then you had a power surge at level 20, but you didn't go for the kill, and we saw them get back up, e equal footing with you, but we saw you kind of turn that around in game three. I want to hear a little bit about your decision-making there. Did you, did you guys know that you missed a window there? How are you processing that going into game two. Uh, talk to us a little bit about w one of the things we talked about was just like kill potential for your team. There were moments where it felt like you could go for the win, but we were seeing it struggle in game one. Um, and then even in game two, it felt like you guys were wrestling with it a little bit. But talk to us about that whole concept. Uh, well, I feel like I'm making excuses here, but game one, it was messy all the way from the beginning of draft because our analyst was not awake until game three. Oh. <laughs> he ended up sleeping in and missing everything. So we, uh, we, we picked a comp that we knew how to play, but we didn't play it well. We really needed to get those gusts on the Sonya. And we just were playing really cautious in game one. Didn't know really what to do. But we were after game two, we've had a lot of confidence and we knew exactly how to play game three. Had to play out the pocket Sylvanas, but everything worked out and it was a great series. Absolutely. I want to hear about that game, too, on Towers of Doom. I don't know if you have questions about yeah, it. Yeah, Towers of Doom. Gosh, you guys came back. Congratulations on that, by the way. What was the sense in the last couple minutes of that match? Were you guys freaking out on comms, or were you very collected and knew what to do the entire time? You know, comms were pretty clean. Towers of Doom is our go-to map. That's why we ended up picking it after the loss. Uh, really, the thing that threw us off was we had to let that Zera tool through pick and ban, so it did give us our Stitches Lunara combo. So we had to play around that, and we just got caught out by some great Void Prisms. Gotcha. So end of the game, we were pretty clean. We knew what to do. The big thing was taking that keep bottom. As, did, once we got that keep bottom, we knew exactly how we needed to end the game. Did cool. you do? Do you think Dallas was aware? To, to me, it felt like Dallas didn't know what was coming. Like I, they were all set up to take those shrines. Do you think they were aware of the fact that uh, that that tower meant what it meant, and then the Mercs pushing the bottom? It just felt like I, I didn't see them responding the way that it seemed like they they should. Well, they definitely responded to the defense on that keep, but yeah. I feel like the Falstad fly was totally off. Yeah. He could have caught and contested bottom and it would have stalled me out to get top lane. But again, little shot calls like that really are hard at the end of the game. We had a big mistake end of game one, too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, last question it. for me, Fitzy, yeah. before I let you go. Um, you know, next week you are the first team that we've casted that will be making it to the Super 16. So congrats on that. But what is your mindset for the week? How are you guys preparing? Are you hitting four or five hours a day? Are you going to take it easy? Are you studying? We just want to know what you guys are going to do to prepare for next week. 
No, we have a, we have a great support staff here, and with Ember sponsoring us, we get a lot of scrim opportunities. So we're gonna be trying to scrim some high level teams to get us really prepared for cool. who we expect to be Blaze. And then after that, we're gonna hope to upset them and then have a rematch with Boston College in the uh, round eight. Cool, man. Well, good luck. Absolutely, Fitzy. Right. Congratulations to you and your team. Thanks for being here with us on Skype. Go celebrate. Get ready for next weekend. Thank you, guys. Have All a right. good day. Man, there's so many nice guys in this tournament. Yeah. They're great. Now I want to cheer for that guy. <laughs> I know, me too. It's so Once cool. Once you get a face that's smiling, and it's like, hey, this is this is me. I'm having my team. You can hear the excitement from him. That just gets me excited. And Tim, we, we talked guys. we talked about the value of support outside of your immediate team. And gosh, you just heard it from his, his mouth right there. They felt like they didn't have uh, that extra mind outside of their team to help them look at the bigger picture. Yeah. And it made all the difference as they moved later into their set. So um, right there, if you're a team out there, if you can find friends who can support you and help give you more advice from the outside, review your replays, help give you that extra angle on your play, it makes all of the difference. It's so cool to hear it from the mouths of the players themselves. Small little difference can help out a lot. Well, we have one more match coming your way. It's going to be UC Irvine versus Illinois. The Mad Banners were making a return. We casted them yesterday, but this will be the first time that we see the Zop boys. So I'm pretty excited to see their matchup. It's going to be a great, uh, a great occurrence because I know for a fact that Irvine has four or five players that are insanely strong. So They're I'm fierce. They took some serious big victories in the round of 64. So it's going to be a fun game indeed. Stick with us. We'll be right back with more Here's the Dorm 2016 action. See you soon. <laughs>